going on, everybody? We are back and live. It is UFC 299 Fight Week. And of course, we're breaking it down for bets and banter this week. We are back once again with a very special guest. We are back once again with the sharpest chat in the game. Appreciate each and every one of you guys making the time to be here. We're talking every fight on the card, starting at the bottom and working our way up. And our great guest that you know, love, and have come to expect, Rich is back in the building. How are you, my man? What's up, bro? Yeah, good to be back at it. Got a decent card this week, so excited to break it down. Um, I'm a bit gutted about my Poirier bet. Anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I cashed out of the fucker. Um, but yeah, we'll get into that in a bit. Um, but first off, I think you got some bragging to do, ain't you? Minorly, man. We'll take the uh, the nice win on Eamon Zahabi last week. I was happy just because I was getting some grief in the comments section. People saying, Liam, why did you spend so much time talking about Eamon Zahabi? And the whole reason was I've been trying to fade this Basharat guy. I knew that I could smell something in the water that just wasn't right. I thought his brother was better. I said as much on the show. But also, I thought Eamon Zahabi had just been historically an underrated fighter, right? And when you look back at the record, Never been a bigger dog than plus 210 against Ricky Tercios, and we were there for that. So I, how could I not be there for that again at plus 600? And I guarantee you one thing. It doesn't matter who he's fighting next. He ain't going to be fucking plus 600 again. So thank you, Eamon Zahabi, for cashing out for the boys, delivering. Uh, that was a, a complete overreaction and recency bias. But without further ado, my man, we got plenty of great opportunities this week. And we always got to say this. The boogie's not going to pay us for the work that we did last week. So whether it was good, whether it's a tough week, we flush it and we're always right back to it. So we got great opportunities this week, my man, starting with a very strange fight. Joanne Wood taking on Marina Moroz, a rematch that no one asked for nine years in the making, Rich. How do you feel about this matchup? Do you think that we're going to see something similar to the first time these two women met up when they were both undefeated fighters and we saw Marina Moroz go out there, shock the world? get that big finish as an underdog? Or do you think it's more likely that Joanne Wood in this retirement fight is able to turn back the clock, maybe have a vintage Joanne Calder Wood 29-28 decision? <laughs> How do you feel about this one, Rich? I'm pissed off, man. I'm uh, I'm pissed off at all these fucking retirement fights. Um, but I'm glad that I got onto this one um, before I did like some research. You know, I was ready to dive into it, see what each girl's been doing on Instagram and, you know, the rest of it. And then as soon as I seen JoJo was retiring, I was like, fuck it. I'm not going to bet her because she's retiring. I can't bet Morose because she's now minus 220 or whatever she was. So uh, there's no value anywhere for me. The only thing I like after seeing a couple of things is maybe Morose reigns two or three when JoJo slows down. You know, per Instagram, she hasn't been doing fuck all for this fight, really. Um, you know, just been waking up a sweat in the gym syndicate where she's at with her fella, uh, John Wood. So maybe two feet free for Morosa, good numbers. Uh, maybe she is literally just showing up for the paycheck and doesn't give a fuck about the result. Um, but yeah, not a fight I really want much interest in, man. Yeah, for me, Rich, this is a fight I, I kind of went back and forth in my mind because at first I was just making a case for Marina Morose in this spot, right? Like I think Joanne Calderwood, to your point, retiring, don't like that. Um, not very good, don't like that has a really bad record inside the distance in the UFC, like just goes out there, finds ways to get finished. If you look through half of her opponents, their only finish win is against Joanne Wood. Um, you know, Marina Moroz being a part of that, right? She's not a prolific finisher. She's finished her. She finished Agapova. That's it. Uh, Jennifer Maya finished her, finished nobody else, cut from the UFC. Like you just look through the resume of Joanne Wood. And she's found a way to back fumble. She's found a way to give these other women who struggled to finish Talia Santos, right? Struggled to finish a bunch of her opponents, finishes Joanne Wood in the first round. Alexa Grasso, maybe she's able to pull it off finally against uh, Shevchenko, but what was our, our key, our indicator? I saw her in person choke out Joanne Wood in Columbus, Ohio in a very forgettable night for uh, Joanne Wood. So you just look overall at her resume, a girl that doesn't seem like she's very good at stopping the wrestling and the grappling. Meanwhile, on the other side, Marina Moroz gets submitted by Karini Silva. That was her last rematch that she had to do, right? A rematch of a fight that she won. <laughs> she did look like she had regressed. But the other thing is Karini Silva has made huge improvements, right? And I was expecting Karini Silva to flip the script on her in that one. A girl that's young, hungry, on the come up, not on OnlyFans, not fucking around doing other things. So I do have some mild concerns that Marina Moroz is just 
out on her career as well, kind of phoning it in, in this spot. So if I was to get involved after doing more research, I would just play violence here. I would just hope that one of these women makes a critical mistake, falls apart completely, doesn't have the gas or the cardio, doesn't care. Um, but I do have a sneaking suspicion that Joanne Wood could win a fight that is just ugly, low volume, low tempo, and she just throws a little bit more, maybe wants it a little bit more in her retirement fight, but I can't trust her. I don't believe in her skill set. So for me, picking Marina Moreau's uh, leaning towards violence here, but I just can't trust either of these women based on what we know. Yeah. Um, in. Oh, please, if you have anything to close out on that fight. No, I was just going to say, from what I see, man, um, JoJo doesn't want this fight. Um, it's literally, you might as well just take it. I don't even know what she's earning. Maybe 100K, maybe that's generous. Um, it's literally, you might as well just show up for 15 minutes work and get the money. So I don't think that when the going gets tough, you know, she's going to push through. Um, I can see her breaking against Carolina in her last fight. She dropped off, come round free and was getting tagged up to fuck. So I think if that happens again, man, she literally might just shell up and think, fuck it. Um, I think that's her mentality going in, man. Fair play, my man. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Next up, we've got CJ Vergara taking on Asu Almabayev. And I did listen to the Just Win Baby podcast. If you guys haven't checked that out, Rich does his own show as well. Make sure that you're checking that out and showing love every week. But I know you got a hot take here, Rich. Why don't you go ahead and give it? Well, it is a hot take, I guess, considering I've not seen anyone on CJ. Um, but I don't know why everyone's up this guy's ass, man, this Asu guy. Um, I'll be nice. I was going to say he's shit like I always do, but he's not that good, man. Um, his uh, stand-up isn't great. He's got some overhand rights. He's not comfortable striking. Everything's to set up the takedown. He's five foot nothing. Um you go check his record. He was going to a split with Makovsky, who's 40 years old. Uh, Makovsky was hitting blast doubles on him and putting him on his back. Uh, you go and look at his other opponents prior to the Makovsky fight. And, uh, you know, he's beating a guy who's 4-0. and And then you go and check out that guy's record. He's got ineligible fights on his record. Um, all his fights were against like 0-0, 0-1 type people. So he's got a very padded record, man. And... I don't think beating Ode Osborne um, justifies you being a minus 450 uh, in this position. Ode fight, you go watch that. Ode quit on the store, man. Um, you know, he was done. You could tell that when he came out for that second round, he didn't have it in him. Um, one takedown and he was done. And that's literally what happened. So I don't put too much stock in that win. I think that's what's driving the line from the bookies. Um, and then if you look at the other side on CJ, you know, I know he's not great at anything. He's not too technical, but he's got solid cardio. He's just competed in a marathon. Um, he never fucks off in fights. He doesn't give up in fights. You've seen him against um, Tyra. Uh, Tyra had him in precarious positions in the first round, had his back, had him on the mat. Everyone thought, you know, this is going to be sub one and done. And um, yeah, he reversed the position, went for a head and arm choke himself. He did then get subbed in round two, but I make allowances for that because uh, Tyra's a motherfucker and he's slick with the jiu-jitsu, so no hate there. Um, but yeah, this guy doesn't give up, man. He's got UFC wins. He outlasts people. He puts it on them. I've seen this Asu guy tap to strikes um, on the regional scene. So when I'm getting this dog money, I'm taking the shot. It's only one unit, but I don't think this guy's for real, man, and he's going to get fraud checked. And uh, why not CJ, man? So bet. Yeah, I think this is an interesting one, Rich. Uh, DraftKings came to market with this one, right? Like this wasn't a line that opened up on Bet Online. a little bit more sophisticated outfit in my view. They opened in minus 142. That did not last, right? Like they've obviously seen this one get blown out of the water. Um, and then you see Bet Online opens it at a minus 335, and then they make their way to minus 500. So I just think that for one thing, this line was probably not accurate ever at minus 142 in terms of how they opened it. Like, I just think that's DraftKings taking a, a shot in the dark. Um, certainly, I don't think that mapped with public perception, right? But when you look, CJ Vergara is a guy that I just have a little bit of a hard time parsing out if he's serious about fighting. The reason I say that, the guy misses weight for like half of his UFC appearances so far, which is frustrating, right? The Clayton Rodriguez win, it's fine, except that Clayton Rodriguez then misses weight, gets moved up a weight class and embarrassed his next fight. So I was just like, okay, 
I don't know how to evaluate some of his wins. Now, on the Almabayev side, um, I'm not minus 600 ready to endorse this kid, right? So I definitely think dog or pass situation at the current odds. The things that I liked about his game uh, and the things that I wanted to address from the chat as well, Crystal in the chat says, um, CJ, if he makes weight, Asus topology is wrong. He got KO'd by Ulan Bekov. I would disagree. He he tapped the strikes against Ulan Bekov, and I'm not sure if that was a result of him blowing out his shoulder or what exactly happened there, but it's kind of a weird sequence where they're wrestling. He picks him up, slams him, and is throwing ground and pound, and then Asu just, like, taps his own shoulder. There's, like, 15 seconds left in the fight, and he was going to lose. So I just think that he kind of was like, bro, my shoulder, like, let's just be done with this. Um, still not a great sign, though, right? Like, when you're talking about minus 600 – you want to leave no doubt. You want to have no ambiguity. Now, I think he's cleaned up some of his wrestling, his grappling, his transitions. The other thing to note, Tagiru Lombekov is a pretty big guy for the division at Flyweight, right? He's actually difficult for a lot of guys to deal with on his size. And I think that was a big part of the problem. Asu looks like he's half his size, right? He's not a very big Flyweight. And the thing about CJ Vergara is we know he normally shows up for these fights at 129 pounds. So it's like, there's a chance that he's just too big to be a Flyweight and like, he can't really make the weight class optimally, but that won't matter if he's 129 and gets moved up to 35 next time. If he's just a bigger guy on fight night, a little bit stronger, a little bit more physical in some of those positions. So if I'm betting on somebody with a predicate that's like, I need them to be a grappler. I need them to go out there and get takedowns. I need them to be in top position. I would prefer if they're bigger, right? Because we've seen the guys that have given him some problems. Tatsuro Tyra, long guy, very talented with the grappling. I had him be a sub. I also had him be a sub in round one. So close. CJ Vergara was able to hang on there a little bit longer than I anticipated. But when you look, there is examples of CJ Vergara just giving his back sometimes standing up to his feet. That is, I think, the biggest concern for him here is that I think it was Miller. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but some guy on the regional scene, it was what gave me the confidence Tyra was going to beat him, was just that this guy got barreled over, taken down quickly and gave his back trying to stand. I do think the thing that I also would criticize CJ about is his chin is not elite for the flyweight division, right? Like he's just been rocked, wobbled, hurt all over the place. The guy who can't, like Daniel Lacerda, right? Couldn't buy a win in the UFC. The closest he came to getting one is chasing this guy around the octagon. But you did see heart, toughness, grit. And those are the things that you need for a plus five, plus 600, these type of fighters. It doesn't need to be the guy has every clear advantage on paper. You're rarely going to find that. But something like Eamon Zahabi last week, I didn't think he had every clear advantage on paper. In fact, he was the older guy. He might have been a little slower. I thought he had the tactics, the will to win. I thought that he had a path to victory. Those are the things you need. So I don't think it's an unreasonable take. Uh, but for me, I, I haven't quite gotten there yet. So I'll do a little more research on the fight, see what I come up with. Uh, but the other thing I'll mention, I had a ends by sub the last couple times that uh, that CJ has fought. Like you mentioned, he went for a sub on Tyra, right? That shows some confidence, willingness to grapple. And I do think we've seen this guy submit to strikes before, right? We've seen him in some compromised positions. You talked about the fact Makovsky, 40 years of age, was taking him down. So if they get into a wild brawl, I think that will probably lead to somebody shooting a takedown. And I also think that Asu's going to try and wrestle and grapple all night. So for that reason, could look for an ends by sub potentially to cover both sides here. But with that being yeah. said, my man, any closing thoughts on this one? Yeah, you make some good points, man. Um, he did tap to strikes before. And I think if you've been a bitch previously, you've still got that bitch in you. So I like that for my bet. And um, Zach Murkowski, his nickname's Point Size, man. He was tiny, and he was able to hit these blast doubles and put this guy on his back. And, um, yeah, although, like I mentioned initially, CJ, he's not the most technical, but he's got heart, tenacity. And in my opinion, that's what you need to beat someone like Asu because I expect him to get his takedowns, you know, for the first couple of minutes. Um, but I'm betting on CJ to stay safe like he did against Tyrett get back up. And then when the second round starts, man, and this guy can't get his takedowns, I think CJ is going to be putting it on him with the punches. Uh, and hopefully it looks something like, um, Br Br what's his name? Mike Breeden against Jubilee, where he's walking him down. The guy's got fuck all left because he's got nothing on the feet. All he's got is these takedowns that he's not able to hit. And, um, yeah, he gets fucked up, man. So looking forward to it. Shout out to you. Shout out to Crystal also says nobody named Carlos is losing in Miami. So narrative nation has made their presence felt on this fight. Um, I do think that CJ might get a little bit of that local love uh, just because he's got the name 
and he's got the attitude, right? He normally comes out, um, you know, fired up, ready to fight. So should be a good scrap here. I'm excited for that one. Next up, my man, we've got the debut of Robles to Spain. And the last thing I did before I got on the show, Rich, is watch his fights, right? Because I had said on my own show that I'm not a Josh Parisian guy. He looks like a tall glass of milk to me. I've never believed in him as a fighter, period. I think that I bet Alain Bado against him. If you know what I'm saying, like, I think he's the worst fighter in the UFC and heavyweight division. But when you look, he's also come through as a dog before, right? So I do look for proof of concept. Greg Rebello on the contender series, I think, was like minus 500, minus 600 against him. And it just goes to show you heavyweight is a stupid weight class, right? These guys get into ridiculous fights. And if somebody gets underneath somebody else, they just might not get up, right? They are big, tubby guys. And it's just hard to start moving around, creating space. When somebody big like that is on top of you, Josh Parisian, right? It's like a fridge on top of you, right? So when you saw Alan Badil get stuck under there, he was like, I'm ready to check out, right? It doesn't take great skill or sophistication. It's like, I'm going to put my chest on you. I'm going to try and land a couple shots. I'm going to be big, heavy, and make you uncomfortable. Now, when you look at Robles de Spain, I do think that this guy is a very good athlete. I think I've heard some people this week say, I don't know that his athleticism is all that. How many guys that are, you know, six foot seven? can lift their own leg above their head. Very few, right? Like very few. I think the leg dexterity, the speed, the athleticism, the balance as well. There was a couple of times where it looked like he was going to get taken down and then just found his footing back underneath it. If you know what I'm saying? Like he was getting pushed back and he would be running his feet backwards and then just have his weight underneath himself again. So I do think in terms of like natural athleticism, you put these guys in a decathlon, it's Robles is winning every event, right? Josh Parisi is not winning one event, but I also just have a feeling the price is a little bit too steep. The bookmakers open at minus four, minus five. They're trying to get money on the Parisian side in my view. Uh, but they also know no matter what we do, we're going to write Robles money in this spot because we've opened him in a parlay type position, right? So parlay betters are just going to say, I take what the bookmaker gives me. They tell me it's minus 400. I believe them. I just have a feeling that the better bet if I was to be on chalk in this fight is the under one and a half rounds, right? Because I see Robles as a guy that has been constantly finishing guys in the first round. I do think he's very aggressive in how he fights. He comes out, he's swinging heavies. He looks like he's ready to engage. And I just don't know that he's about the ruckus, right? The things that I found mildly concerning, I think it was John Stargarian mentioned on his show, Club and Sub, shout out to John, uh, that he had said he didn't come over to MMA for a while because he was afraid of getting knocked out. That's not a good reason to not come to MMA. And I thought it was so ironic watching his fights. Like, this guy's afraid to get knocked out. I'm like, bro, you should be afraid you're going to kill somebody. Um, but it is a mindset issue, right? Uh, so when I'm looking at this fight, he doesn't have a ton of experience to fall back on. It's at a pay-per-view, right? This isn't in the anonymous Apex Center against Josh Parisian in front of a bleacher full of seven people. So those are the things that give me a touch of pause here and make me think that maybe Parisian could have some ability to weather a storm and come back. But even Alain Bado should have finished this guy. Like, let's not call let's call a spade a spade. Alain Bado quit and acted like a complete fool in that fight. Um, so he's not very good either. Uh, I think the Spain should win. I think he should kill him very quickly. Um, but I just can't trust the price tag. How do you feel about this one, Rich? <clears throat> yeah, the line is wide, man, and there are some dogs on this card, but I don't think uh, Parisian's one of them, man. Um, yeah, like I'm going to mention later with my Poirier bet, I think one of the best, um, whatever you want to call it, attributes I've got when it comes to capping is the things I see on Fight Week, man. Interviews, um, you know, the face-offs, the stare-downs, uh, Instagram and stuff. And what I'm seeing from Instagram is a guy who's just taking a fight, man. Um, his training's ridiculous. Um, you know, somebody posted it on Twitter. It's a joke, man. He's just doing some fucking hopscotch or some bullshit. Um, so yeah, I think Josh is showing up. I think this guy, we're going to fade him at some point for sure, but it's not going to be against Josh. I think he gets his knockout in round one, um, hypes up the crowd. Um, yeah, Josh ain't the one man. So good luck with you bet, John. Um, but Parisian isn't for me. Narrative Nation here checking back in. And the thing I wanted to bring up before we moved off this fight, big Cuban population in Miami, Florida. I do think they would love to have a freaking celebration. All the Cubanos lifting up Robles to Spain. Also, 
he just looks more like a guy you want to market, right? If I'm in a business department somewhere, Josh Parisian is a guy that is enhancement talent 100% of the time. He's not going up into a, a big position for me. Whereas Robles to Spain at 36 years of age, one, two, three big wins, we're putting him in a main event. It's like, who cares? It's heavyweight, right? So like we just saw Shamil Gaziev. They're so desperate for heavyweights. They're like, hey, bro, you got to win in the UFC over Martin Budai. Come on down. Like they're just looking for anybody that could have some talent, some upside. And I do think this is a guy that fits the, the bill on the night, right? A guy in Miami to come out there, knock him out, get the crowd going, 14 fights, right? We can't be out here all night. I feel like they're bringing him out to get a, a knockout in round one, light the crowd on fire and keep the ball rolling. Yep. But with that being said, man, we've got the next fight in the light heavyweight division. Not an easy fight to call, in my view, Rich. Um, why don't we kick this one over to you first? We've got El Monstro, Felipe Lynch, taking on Iwan Kutalaba, the Hulk. Sorry, bro. This is the only fight I don't give a shit about. Um, I literally fought they fought three times already. Um, what can you say? I'm waiting to see Linz at weigh-ins to see if he's on the juice still because that matters. Uh, when he's on the juice, he's a fucker. When he's not, he's a bitch and he gets KO'd by Boza. So I'm waiting till weigh-ins. I want to see if he's on the juice or not. Iron's an idiot. He always ends up getting himself subbed or bonked by somebody, man. Um, so, yeah, good luck with your bet if you bet in this one, man. But what I will say is uh, I was having this for earlier. When Iron lost, he lost against Django. What's his name? The big Kenny Nigerian guy. He lost to Kennedy and Zechiku. He lost to Johnny Walker and he lost to Ryan Spann, all three in a row. Exactly. And what do they all three of them have in common? They're all big fuckers like Linz, man. So Iron, we know he's a bully. We've seen him at weigh-ins. I think when he's the bully, he does okay. But when he goes up against these big fuckers, he fucks up. So Linz would be my side just based on that. But I don't know. We'll see at weigh-ins in it. See what's up. Yeah, I do want to see the weigh-in for this one. Um, and I don't say that about every fight, right? But the CJ fight, he's a guy that's missed weight a bunch of times. Felipe Leans, he's a guy that's looked like two different guys in the UFC, right? So, like, we know that Felipe Leans, I think he's, like, the biggest advocate of USADA getting the hell out of the sport. He's like, hey, man, let's have a lower risk. Let me come in here, juice to the tits, please. And when you look at this guy, I do think Felipe Leans has had a pretty easy run through the UFC. Like, I think in his more recent fights, I thought he was going to knock out OSP in the first round. I thought he was completely washed to bits. But you look, and I just feel like they kind of like him, right? Like, I don't think there was any reason to give him all these layup-type fights, nice enough fights, winnable fights. And Iwan Kutalaba is where the rubber could meet the road, right? I do worry that he could get knocked out in the first round just because he's been knocked out in the first round. He's kind of stood in the pocket before, got clipped. He can get hit. Kutalaba's a violent guy. He comes out swinging wild. I think he's a panic thrower, right? I think that everything Kutalaba does, he's trying to get you before you get him because he's afraid. And when I look at a guy like that, I do think Lynn should be able to manage this fight. Maxime Grishin, big guy, strong, physical. I thought that was an easier fight for Lynn just because he's not very dangerous early. I thought he was going to be able to manage his way into that fight, and he was able to do so. We've also seen, uh, you know, at the time, I thought that the win over, uh, what's his name, I'm um, drawing a blank on his name, uh, Marcin Pracknow. I thought the win over Pracknow meant nothing. Pracknow is now like getting a couple wins. Is he a great like world beating light heavyweight? No, he's not. He's still kind of average. He's still pretty basic. But Devin Clark's been around 13, 14 fights in the UFC. He can't get one over on him, right? Felipe Linz was able to do so, was able to be pretty clinical about those positions. So I think that in this fight, the longer it goes, the more it favors Felipe Linz. And the one other thing I wanted to mention, Rich, Everybody seems to be picking either Kutalaba by knockout, uh, Linz by knockout. Maybe they, they think it's going to go the distance. Uh, but I just think that Felipe Linz probably has a pretty substantial advantage on the ground in extended exchanges. Because you look at Felipe Linz, and he does have some submission wins on his resume. Hasn't been recently, right? I think the last one was in the PFL on his route to a million dollars. But if you look, Iwan Kutalaba isn't getting submitted by prolific grapplers. He's not getting submitted by the, the upper echelon guys uh, in terms of their jiu-jitsu in the division, right? The Johnny Walkers of the division, uh, Ryan Clark, or excuse me, not Ryan Clark, Ryan Spann, he's basically a one-note guillotine threat. I appreciate that about him, right? If you're going to pick one move, go for the guillotine. I like that one. But when you're just looking at this guy's broad body of work, I'm not impressed by Iwan Kutalaba. He's 6-8. and eight. 
with one no contest in the UFC. He runs into punches. He loves getting knocked out. He loves getting finished. He loves getting submitted. I just feel like he's not a trustworthy guy. So I don't, I don't feel bullish on Linz. I wish the plus money was a little bit bigger to get involved. Uh, but what I do think is he's probably going to be my pick to win this fight outright. So um, probably some marginal betting value at plus 115. But yeah, I like that. In man. any case, um, yeah, I like that. Linz, Linz sub two free after they fucking feel each other out, fucking cage pushing and all that bullshit in round one. I like Linz, like you said, in the extended fight. And yeah, see what submission two and three is, man. Um, I just checked the metrics too, and he, he's up on both uh, Linz. So yeah, I'll go Linz, man, based on this combo. Hell yeah. Let's go El Monstro. Get one more for the, the good guys. One more for Team Brazil. Uh, next up, my man, we got Michelle Demolidor Pereira taking on Mihal Oleksichuk. And I got to be honest, man, I don't want to be uh, biased here because I like Mickey O. I like Mihal Oleksichuk. He's a cool guy. I've had some interactions with him on social media. I've liked what I've seen from him broadly in the UFC because he's a tough bastard. He gets in your face. He throws punches. He's not super uh, difficult to predict how his fights are going to go most of the time. He's going to get in your face and throw boxing combinations. That's what he does, right? So you give him a Kyle Barajo who could really grapple. That's not going to turn out good for him. You give him guys that are willing to strike like Shidi and Jikawani, he will tank damage and keep coming forward, keep throwing shots and not have any compunction about doing so. And uh, he's a guy that fought at 205, right? So we just talked about Asu Amabayev. He looked undersized compared to some of these guys. He looked undersized compared to everybody, bro. He's still not big at middleweight. And this guy was out there like, all right, let's figure it out, big man. And he'd get in somebody's face, throw, and then gas out completely because it's hard to carry around extra tissue, right? You're just like out there, 20 pounds of uh, you know body fat or whatever. It's not going to be good for uh, you know longer fights. I do think cutting the middleweight requires some lifestyle commitment from him. I do think it takes him, you know, doing some cardio, maybe hitting some road work, but he's still not very big for this division. And on the other side here, um, it's ironic because Michelle Pereira comes from 170, right? But he's actually pretty sizable for this middleweight division. He looks huge compared to Petrosky, who's a big, strong guy. He looked like he was twice his size. Uh, and that's a guy that should have been able to compete in the wrestling and grappling, I felt. Um, we never really got to see that play out, right? He was kind of scared to engage with them. He got hit big from far away. But the things that give me some minor pause on the Demolidor side is we've seen him knocked out at 185 pounds against Dusko Todorovic before he got to the UFC. We've seen him fumble the bag, do really stupid things at various points in his career, mostly at 170 pounds. And now he's back up at 185. And I do have some question marks. I just say to myself, like, is this guy a proven commodity at 185 pounds? Because he's kind of foolish, right? He was one, two fights away from a potential, what, title shot, title eliminator at 170, misses weight against Wonder Boy, causes a bad PR incident, gets pulled from the fight card. Now he's up at 185, just languishing and trying to build from the bottom again. And so it's not to say that that can't work out. It is just to say it leaves me with a little bit of question marks here. I'd like to see a good performance from him dispatch another guy who wants to be there at 185 pounds. But the last thing I'll mention as I kick this over to you, Rich, people are getting after me saying Mihal Oleksiejczyk no longer with Ankos MMA. I'm not seeing him in some of those photographs and some of those pictures. He used to be training there with the Blahoviches of the world, with the Murdoffs of the world. Is he getting in good training right now? It's hard for me to say. A lot of his shit is written in Polish. Um, he's training at a bunch of different gyms. He's training with a bunch of different uh, friends, it looks like. But also, they're they're not friends like, you know, hey, Tom, Dick, and Harry off the street. They're K-1 guys. It's a, a purple belt champion from Poland. Like, the, he does seem to have some kind of guys around him that know how to fight. But is that a serious team? Is this a great camp? Did they put everything together properly? I'm not sure. And I do think that Michelle Pereira looks like he's in the right shape. He's training with Smotritsky and a bunch of other guys, 170, 185 type guys in the UFC at Extreme Couture. That seems like a better environment to improve to work on your skill set so for me i'm gonna pick uh demolidor um but i'm not feeling extremely bullish about this one how do you feel rich yeah well you mentioned the uh, demographics earlier and um miami's like 68 percent hispanic and white boys are like 11 percent. so i think this is a setup man um for pejera I think Lord Michael is going to get fucked. Someone mentioned it in the chat, the submissions 500. I like that. 
And um, yeah, someone sent me some info. I sent some shit on Instagram. Um, I can't say his last name, so I just call him Lord Mikey. So yeah, Mikey, he's just had a kid. I uh, read something where he said he didn't want to pay his 20% to his manager. So he's fucked his manager off and is managing himself now. That's not needed. Uh, and like you said, I don't think he's training anywhere because he doesn't want to pay the gym fees. So he's literally just bouncing around, getting whatever work he can with his fucking brother-in-law, who, whoever it might be. And um, yeah, outside of that shit um, on the Lord Michael side, man, I think there's a reason um, they put Pajera on this card, man. It's an exciting card. It's, um, you know, packed with some big stars and they want finishes, man. They want, um, you know, people like him to excite the crowd. He's good at 185, not cutting weight. It's better for him. Um, so, yeah, I think he's going to fucking um, be too elusive for Mikey to catch him in the big cage. And, um, yeah, I think he can just toy with him from the outside. Or if he's shown just a little bit of IQ, take him down and get the submission, man. He's a black belt. Um, yeah, I don't think uh, Mikey's going to do well in this fight at all. I think he gets finished, man. Um, and I'm hoping it's a submission also, so... We'll see how that goes. Yeah, before I had seen a price here, Rich, on my first look, I had just said, like, if I was going to get involved with anything, it'd probably be a contrarian prop on Pereira by sub. I was expecting a little bit more on the plus money because he's not a guy that consistently wrestles and grapples. <clears throat> However, sometimes the price can be a little bit telling, right? If they're, if they're shading so much towards an outcome that doesn't happen routinely, it doesn't always come through. Like Eric Anders, that's one example of a of prop that didn't come through. However... You saw that they, there was life for that prop. You saw why there was opportunity, why people thought it could be a possibility. And I do think the same here. The other thing to note, Jamie Pickett had given us some reason to believe, like, hey, if it gets into an extended ground exchange, I might not just fold up the tent. You know, like Bo Nickel had to hold him in there for two minutes before he gave up. Um, you look, the Dawkins fight where he tapped out, um, you know, with like a second left on the clock. You can say whatever you want about Jamie Pickett, but he said after the fact, he's like, my tongue was in between my teeth. I thought it was going to bite off my tongue. Yo, I'd tap too, bro. Like uh, when you just look at some of these situations, like, all right, he had a, a little bit of a tough run and he almost knocked out Anders in that fight. So I think Anders was just about risk mitigation. Let me find any way to win the fight. Now in this spot, I do think Michelle Pereira has to know based on how he performed last time out, hey, that's a big game changer for me. If I can go out there and get finishes, get really relevant wins quickly, number one, I could be more active. I'm at 185. I don't have to cut all the same amount of weight. But number two, people will give a shit about my fights again. Because the one thing that stands out about his record from a positive standpoint, Rich, he's got a horrific resume to the decision. Except it's been getting better and better, right? Like in the UFC lately, he's on a streak of decision wins. It's been hard for guys to get over on him. Unless he does something completely boneheaded like he did against Nico Price, flying backflip onto his head, could have been disqualified. Unless he does some stupid shit like that, this should be a fight that he can, uh, you know, use his superior footwork and bail himself out with takedowns if need be. So I think he can alleviate pressure with those takedowns. And for me, that could be a possible game changer for him here. Well, yeah, um, two things to mention, man. He doesn't do stupid shit anymore. You ain't seen him doing backflips and shit like he did against Connolly and trying to be a fucking circus act. And the second thing to mention is the submission opened at 750 and it's down to 500 now. So if you want it, get in there fast because it's just getting worse, man. Makes sense to me. And I do think that uh, the line is probably going to be uh, a little bit of a tug of war here because I have seen a lot of love for Mickey O. He's a fun guy. He's a fan favorite style. But uh, I do think that's more of the hardcore money, um, you know, coming in the hardcore fans, you know. But I do have a feeling that, um, you know, some sharp money is on the Pereira side, keeping this in check at minus 150 or so. Next up, my man, we got Pedro, the young, the ironically named, the young Punisher Munoz taking on Tyler Phillips, the Matrix. Um, you know, two great nicknames here. One is a little bit more appropriate now. But when you look, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of Pedro Munoz, right? I like his game. Great guillotine. I've said before, Rich, and you can tell me whether you agree or disagree, I think he's got the best chin in the history of the bantamweight division. When you just look, it's either him or Cheeto Vera, right? Like they both have kind of stood in the pocket with a bunch of high-level guys and come out the other side without getting finished. But I do think for Pedro Munoz, the quality of competition throughout his career has been rock solid. And the fact that this guy just stands in the pocket with everybody, never has fear, never has a, 
uh, step back, right? He stood in the pocket with Cody Garbrandt and kept pointing to the ground like, hey, <laughs> let's figure it out, man. Let's keep doing this. And I actually think Cody was on a suicide mission there because he had his leg completely compromised in the first round, right? You saw Pedro, when he starts chopping away at the legs on these guys, they don't like it. Sean O'Malley, I thought, was a little bit muted in his approach against Pedro because he was like, I don't want to kick this guy's leg and hurt myself. I don't want to get kicked in the leg and get hurt. So he was very tepid when he was going against Pedro, using a lot of feints, movement, and then the eye poke kind of ends that one prematurely. I thought Sean was starting to come on in that fight. But in any case, Pedro's a guy that is not an easy out, right? And I remember, I think it was Gutierrez, minus 190 or so against him. I was there to stand on the other side and find out because he's very durable. You're not going to outgrapple him. Like, I just I don't see these guys outgrappling him at all. And when guys have turned into a wrestler against him, He's rolling them through with the tightest guillotine you've ever seen into the mounted finish. So I've really respected what I've seen for Pedro over time. I do worry that he could always become old overnight, right? He has absorbed a ton of shots over the course of his career. He does stand in the pocket. He does have that willingness. And Kyler can be fast. He can be explosive. I faded Kyler before, right? Like, if you remember, Rich, I think we bet together on Kyler Phillips by sub against Marcelo Rojo, different quality of grappling, right? Guy from the Latin American regional scene. And then we've also, uh, you know, been there to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to fade him. I, I faded him with Howley and Paiva. I had Howley and Paiva by decision. But even in that fight, they could have stopped that one. And Howley and Paiva is a tough bastard, too. He's willing to take some damage. He was basically unconscious. And then they woke him back up. He's like, all right, I'll go back out there. Gets the win in round two and three. But that told me a lot of what I needed to know, Rich, which is that if you can survive, if you don't get finished, you can make a competitive fight with this guy. By round two, he's like, oh, I don't know, I, how much output should I really go up for? By round three, the guy is slowing down visibly in almost every fight that I've seen from him. Victor Henry, back on the regional scene, said, hey, what's up? What time is it? Because he had the cardio to keep pushing this kid. Uh, and I do feel that's a guy that's not as dangerous, right? I like Victor Henry. Very fun guy. But we saw him land, what, 150 uncontested significant strikes on Hany Barcelos, couldn't put him away. He doesn't have that much power. He's more of a submission guy. So for me, that's the thing that tells me Pedro Munoz live by all methods in this fight. I think more often than not, this fight's going the distance. So I think it's going to be a competitive decision. I think it's a daughter pass situation um, after thinking about it a little bit more. How do you feel about this one, Rich? Yeah, I won't add too much, man, because that pretty much covered everything. Um, I think Pedro is alive. I think that Kyler is a bit too fancy sometimes. You know, he's been able to style on people earlier in his career. And then he's just come up against um, some durable, durable people of late. Um, and yeah, Pedro is exactly that, man. I don't think at this age, I know 37 on paper might seem concerning, but I don't think so. Um, he hasn't shown me that he's digressing in his fights. So, yeah, he's not going to fuck off Pedro. I think he certainly wins round three. Um, that's just like a mean thing against uh, Kyler. We know he drops off with the cardio. Um, so, yeah, you just need him to win either round one or two, man. And uh, you got a good underdog bet there. So, yeah, dog or pass situation all day, man. There you have it. So I do think Kyler Phillips has some, uh, you know, skills, some prospect upside. He trains with good guys, um, but I just haven't seen enough of it. I haven't seen him translating at this higher level yet. So only 11 and two as a professional still has a lot of time to gain some experience, but for me, just hasn't proven enough uh, for the price tag at this point. Next up, we've got Mateus, the gamer Gamrot taking on Rafael Dos Anjos. And this is a fight where, uh, you know, it seems like everybody's, you know, writing in Gamrot uh, as, you know, old news. Like, um, you know, it's already over. He already beat him. It's already a free win. Um, I don't know that RDA is the kind of guy you want to do that with, honestly. Um, when you look, RDA last time out against Vicente Luque, I thought Vicente Luque was going to get the win. Why? RDA is half his size. You know, he's, like, he's just not going to have the physicality uh, to stand up to him, right? And when I look at, at those kind of matchups, at 170, RDA has struggled against other good grapplers, right? Against guys that he can outgrapple, he wins. Kevin Lee, he was able to outgrapple him. He got the win in that one. Um, you see other fights where he goes out there, competes tooth and, and nail with uh, Colby Covington, right? So I don't think that he is a complete uh, pushover. I'm going to kick this one over to you, Rich. But um, I, I do want to just give that credence as we start talking about this fight, where I, I feel a lot of people are ready to write off RDA uh, because he's a little bit older for the division. He's been around a long time. Um, but I, I just think that could be a little foolhardy 
uh, to count out a guy like this. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, sorry, man. I don't have much. And sorry to RDA because I do think he uh, is coming to the end, man. Um, you know, I was on about people digressing. You know, Pedro isn't. I think RDA is the Luque fight. You know, Luque was doing to him what he's done throughout his whole career. So, yeah, he just wasn't able to, um, you know, implement his usual game plan. It's fine when you're fighting Brian Barberina and your submission is plus 300. That's nice. But, um, yeah, against Gamra, just younger, more athletic. I think he's just going to do the Luke thing and probably win a, uh, a decision, man. Just, um, you know, get more ground um, time, more top control, and, uh, yeah, win the decision. But the decision was shit as well. It was, like, minus 200. So it's an unplayable fight for me. Um, and, yeah, unfortunately, I think RDA is on his way out, man. Unless they give him some more layup fights, you know. But um, Gamra, Gamra's just too decent, man. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at this record, and, and let me talk about, um, you know, the things that I, I think stood out to me about RDA just coming into this weekend. Um, you look, and let's just talk about the last five fights for RDA, uh, just so we have, like, a relevant, up-to-date sample size. We don't want to talk about, you know, fighting Jeremy Stevens 20 years ago, right? So Michael Chiesa, 2020, January of 2020, goes out there, loses that fight. Michael Chiesa, big guy, 170-pounder, grappler, that's what he does by trade. I thought that was a tough matchup for RDA. Um, Paul Felder goes out there, gets the win. Close fight, albeit, uh, you know, close fight. I think that was at 170 pounds on short notice. Paul Felder is a guy who's a 55, 70 tweener. He's fought at 70 before, you know, lost to the Mike Perry's of the world. But he can keep it in there with any 155er. He's strong. He's physical. He's not, a, you know, not afraid to fight, right? So Paul got in there, scrapped with him. Um, close enough decision. Gets the win. I thought he deserved the win, although it was close. The Rafael Fazeev fight, I loaded up on Fazeev. Big on Fazeev, right? I'm like, this guy's too dangerous. You don't want to stand in there for 25 minutes with this guy. I was sweating just a little bit, right? Like, I thought that Fazeev was doing enough to get the scorecards, um, you know, I, but barely, right? I thought it was a close enough fight um, through the minutes. I didn't think he was, like, blowing him out of the water. And then the fifth round knockout, I'm like, oh, thank God. Don't have to sweat this one going to the cards. He's dead. But when you look, RDA. He's been finished via strikes three times, right? Not a guy who's very easy to get out of there um, with your hands. Is Gamrot like a, a thunderous puncher? Is he a massive kicker? Is he going to go out there and drop him, finish him, hurt him? I don't necessarily see that, right? So uh, then if you look the next time out, um, Hanato Moicano, I mean, Hanato Moicano, I loaded up seven and a half units on RDA. I was like, where where is Moicano going to beat him? It's like Moicano is not going to strike with this guy. He will get fucked up. I was like, Moicano is not out wrestling him and out grappling him because at 155 against other 155 pounders, tell me the guys that just easily out wrestled and out grappled RDA fucking Khabib. Like, like there's been a handful of them, but like at 155, he's not an easy mark to the wrestling and the grappling. When he moved up to 170, he wasn't that easy a mark to the wrestling and the grappling until he got old, right? You look at the Colby fight. That's a 48, 47 fight for whoever you want to score it for. If you want to score that for RDA, I don't think you're an insane person. I think that that was a close fight. I scored it for Colby, 48-47, and I had a lot of respect for RDA on the other side of that, right? So I just look at this guy and say, okay, you lose to Vicente Luque. Vicente Luque is huge. He's a big guy for 170, and he can grapple. He's a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's got a great dart stroke. You can't just fuck around and go for your own takedowns against Vicente. And he was still competing late into the fourth and the fifth round there. He was still trying his best. So I'm like, is this guy really washed if he can fight for five rounds at 170 pounds, a suboptimal weight class against not guys that are like fringe guys? Vicente Luque has been ranked in the top 10 at welterweight for how long? This guy was one fight away from a title shot. People forget this. He was on a seven fight win streak. And the thing that stopped him is that he missed weight for the backup fighter. That's it. And then they were like, oh, yeah, yeah not going to happen. Now you go fight Jeff Neal and get knocked out. That's what they did to him. But this is a guy that was one fight away from a title shot. So I think the implication that like losing to him means you're a washed bum is just so insane to me. Like, yay, the guy got brain damage. And that was the whole theory of the case. Like, oh, Vicente Luque, he's never going to win another fight in the UFC. Well, I just didn't see that. Right. I didn't see the one to one comparison there. So in this fight, I won't belabor the point. Right. I mean, is Gamrod a great fighter? Hell yeah, he's a great fighter. I bet on him many times. Five units at minus 180 against um, uh, Carlos Diego Ferreira, who I did not think had the tools the gas or the willpower to compete with a guy like Gamera. 
right? There's a reason he never won a UFC title. The, not the right guy, right? When the going gets tough, he gets going. But when you look at how he performs uh, in that fight, it was a close enough fight. It was back and forth. The minutes are close. And then Gamrot breaks him by hitting a knee to the body that breaks his ribs. Nice shot. Like, well, well played. But that also didn't tell me, like, Gamrot was, like, clinically way better than him. It even was a closer fight than I was hoping for and expecting in round one. Okay, and then, then we look at the uh, the fight with, um, what's his name, uh, Jalen Turner, right? Big, strong, uh, talented guy. Split decision win for Mateus Gamrot in that fight. And let's not forget, right? Like, I think people may forget, Rich, Matt Frivola easily top-timed uh, Jalen Turner to the tune of a dominant decision, right? Like, he just outlasted him in the cardio, put him on his ass, passed his guard, went for freaking triangle chokes from the mountain and shit. Like he was going out and trying to out grapple this guy systemically. Did we see that from Gamrod? Did we see Gamrod dominate in the top position everywhere he wanted to? No, he got rocked in that fight as he has been in several other fights, right? Is it like he's never dropped the ball before in winnable fights? I thought the Benil Dariush fight was a layup. I was like, this guy's faster. He should be able to compete with him in the grappling. Obviously, Benny's not a pushover of a fighter. He's a tough guy. But Benny went out there and loaded up a left hand that you could see coming from a half a mile away. And this dude sprinted full force into it. For me, I just can't trust a guy like this. Guram Kutataladze, minus 300. They never gave you the money back, right? He came in injured to that fight. He came in suboptimal. All the people at ATT will tell you that. But you lost on the minus 300. You don't get the money back. Guram Kutataladze, he's lost several times since. He's been exposed as being just an, another guy in the lightweight division. Okay. Benny Dariush. Well, at least he went on to win the title after, right? He vindicated that loss. He said, hey, no problem. No, he gets knocked out in the first round in his next two fights. So he now cannot survive five minutes with a top lightweight, but he can go out there and beat you over 15 minutes, drop you with a huge left hand. Like, I'm just, I'm having a hard time squaring all these circles. So for me, it's a dog or pass situation. I don't think Gamrod has the tools to consistently cover minus 450, minus 500 prices against other guys that aren't incompetent grapplers, that aren't completely fugazi. So I just think RDA, tough guy, seasoned, skilled in all positions, probably a hard guy to cover minus 450 against unless you're a huge knockout threat on the feet. So for me, uh, I don't see that from Gamera, and uh, it's a prove it spot for me at this price tag. The last thing I'll mention, Rich, from Narrative Nation standpoint, this guy RDA, is he talking about I want to retire? Is he talking about I want to fuck off? No, he's talking about... Patty Pimblett sucks. I beat that guy up. He's the most overranked guy in the division. I, I take on any of these guys. He's basically saying, like, give me these fights that I want. Conor McGregor, big fight. I'll go talk shit. I'll go run it out there with Conor. These kind of things where he's like, I deserve these big money fights. I deserve these opportunities. I think the way he gets them, one big win. And he said yes to everybody. He's fallen on a lot of grenades for this company. And uh, I think they gave him a fight where... He has a winnable fight in front of him here. I don't think it's an easy fight. I think it's a hard fight. But I think that among the guys in the top 10, top 15 at lightweight, who does he have a better chance to beat? I'll wait. So next up, my man, we've got a flyweight contest. And this one, we'll kick it over to Rich first. We've got Caitlin Chukagian taking on Macy, the future barber. How do you feel about this one, my brother? Um... So, yeah, I've changed the mush of the week. The mush of the week is now Macy Barber. Um, I watched their interviews today. She's a, she's a bit, bit of a low IQ type of girl, bit of a rock head. Don't really like her, to be honest. Um, in her interview, she was just being obnoxious, saying that she's going to knock um, Caitlin out. The uh, girls in the division are boring. Um, Aaron Blanchfield is boring. Firo is boring and all this shit. So she's uh, calling for the Grasso fight after this one, saying she wants that one back. And I just think she's overlooking Chukagian, man. I think she thinks that this is a, a done deal. She's going to get her knockout and then go on to better things. I think she just needs to be a, a bit more grounded, man. And... Um, you know, people were giving me shit for changing it to um, Barber because I, I guess they just didn't like the uh, talk from Chukagian. You know, she mentioned um, some stuff in the interview about IVF, et cetera. And um, people see that as, you know, some guy was telling me she's just taking this fight for money. Someone else was telling me she's depressed and I shouldn't be betting on her. 
I don't read it like that, man. I don't put much stock into that and then transfer that into this fight um, to mean anything, to be honest. Um, she's just someone who's getting back in there. Um, she's had some troubles in her private life, and that just is what it is. But I don't think that's going to diminish her as a fighter, and uh, I don't think it's going to matter in this fight. So I don't count that. But what I do like is the fact she's been up to Colorado training with Pennington. Um, she's been putting work in. She knew about this fight a while ago. Um, she's a fucking brown belt. I know it might not seem it from her fights. She hasn't had to show that off. Or Team Enzo Grace. To. Yeah. Um, it's a legit brain belt. No bullshit. And um, Macy Barber, she's an idiot, man. I can see her trying to grapple in this one, take her to the ground, and I hope she gets her fucking arm ripped off, to be honest, because she needs to be humbled, man. Um, Barber in her last fight, you know, she was going life and death with Ribas, and, you know, people will hype Ribas up and say she's good. Yeah, she's good at certain things against certain people, like the fraud she um, KO'd in her in her last fight, I think it was, but she's not that great striking man. And someone like Barber, if Barber is for real, should have, um, you know, made that fight more easy, but she lost the third round. She was getting pieced up. The head kick changed everything. So, um, yeah, I didn't like that look from her man. And we know what Chukagian can do. Stay at distance. Um, you know, the fucking, the noises, uh, influencing the judges, you know, she's got multiple split decision wins. That's what she does. But, um, yeah, I think the sub's a sneaky angle, man. I can see Barber taking her down and um, getting her arm taken off in an arm bar or some shit, man. But nevertheless, however it comes, I like Chukagian in this one. I think she's been writ off for the wrong reasons. She's in fantastic shape per Instagram. And, um, yeah, as much as it's a bet on Chukagian, it's a, a fade on Barber for being a, a bonehead, man. So let's see what happens. You know, Rich, uh, want to just shout out to the 315 people rocking with us live. We've got a great turnout today. Appreciate each and every one of you guys. Make sure you drop a like on the video if you're enjoying the conversation. And make sure that you get subscribed to the channel because we're back here talking fights each and every week. I saw that we had 305 people rocking with us live in honor of Miami. So I had to store that one in the back of the mind. But back to this fight, my man. I think that there's a couple of things that we got to note off the rip. Number one. I have no idea how to handicap the Caitlin Chukagian situation, right? Like, how does it physically impact you to have a miscarriage? I have no idea, right? I'm a man. I never dealt with pregnancy uh, close in my life. Like, there's a lot of things that could just be written off to. I have no idea. So I can't pretend that I know. Now, when you talk about um, how that impacts the fight, uh, I do think that what she said was just her being raw, honest from the heart. She's just talking about, hey, had some problems in my life, um, you know, tried to step away for a while from fighting so I could have a child. It didn't work out for me yet. So maybe I'll go back to that at some point in the future. But right now I need to get back to my career. I need to get back to something where I feel happier. And she said like, uh, you know, it's ironic, but like, this is less stress on my body. This is less stress on my life to take a fight. That's what I know. I'm more comfortable doing that. So that I heard and I was like, you know what? That I just I have to write it off because I don't know what to make of it, but it seemed like she was in a positive headspace about where she's at right now. Now, when you're looking at this fight from a tactic standpoint, I think Macy Barber has made several mistakes throughout her career, um, you know, that are replicable, right? She gets taken down too frequently. Her um her weight is sometimes not properly distributed. She's a little off balance. She likes to come forward and either barrel all the way into her opponent, grab a hold of that clinch. Or she's sometimes a little bit too willing to lean back away from strikes. When you do that, you open yourself up to getting pushed over, right? If somebody's just like leaning their weight back over their haunches, over their hips, they could be easily knocked off balance. So I do think that at times she's too easy to knock off balance. And at times she's too willing to give her back. I think she has decent fundamentals from there in terms of she doesn't just let people submit her easily when they take her back. But we've seen her give up the back on a number of occasions. And if you have somebody who's a little bit more sophisticated from the Dana her system who really understands how to finish with their hand control, I do think there's a chance Caitlin Shukagian could make her pay. I talk about something all the time when we're talking about submissions, Rich, which is limb length. If you don't have long limbs, it's just harder to get submissions. Can you do it? Sure. But you have to be a little bit more selective with your holds. For somebody like Caitlin Shukagian, I do think that she's got enough limb length to grab a hold of somebody's neck, to come around and cinch up a choke. So she has the tools. 
she has the uh, backing, right? She trains with a lot of good people. Northeast shoot box. Shout out to my guy, Ozzy P. Love that expression. And when you look at Caitlin Shikagian, I've oftentimes been on the wrong side of her fights um, when I've tried to fade her because she's a difficult girl to fade. Now, that being said, I had Jessica Andrade, three units at minus 141. She was a smaller favorite in this matchup than we're seeing from Macy Barber. I think that's interesting. On top of that, we talk about recency bias in the sport. It's a what have you done for me lately business. Last time out, Rich, I was on Macy Barber plus 175 against my girl, Amanda Hebas. I do like Amanda Hebas. I do think she's very talented. But the point I made on this show several times is that when she fought Caitlin Chukagian and I got robbed fucking blind, personal opinion, uh, plus 165 on Amanda Hebas, I think at worst it's a minus 110 fight. But in any case, I had a lot of fucking money on that. And it did teach me a hard lesson, which is Amanda Hebas is just a little undersized for 125 because she had every position she wanted. She got everywhere she wanted on Caitlin Chikagian, the mount, the back, here, there, and everywhere. And she just couldn't do anything with it. And Caitlin Chikagian didn't panic. She didn't make any big mistakes. And when she got back up to the feet, she threw enough to take back over the rounds. And it pissed me off. So when I'm looking at this fight, I'm saying to myself, Amanda Hebas was plus 165 against um, against Chuk, and I took her there, right? Uh, I took plus 175 on Macy Barber against Amanda Hebas. Something can't be making sense in the line value if we're now getting to the point where plus 175 on Caitlin Chukagian is the next logical outcome here when she beat Hebas, right? So it's like, I do think what we've seen is a little bit of a market overcorrection here. I like the confidence from uh, Macy. But I do think that it's blending just as a touch over to arrogance as it has in the past, right? When you look at what she's saying, she's talking about, I'm going to go up and fight Juliana Pena. That's the easiest fight, you know, uh, for the, t like, first of all, who asked you? Like, who, who invited you to that title fight? I don't, <laughs> I don't remember that. But on top of that, it's like, okay, she's talking about, uh, you know, the Alexa Grasso fight. That's another time where I bet her and she let me down. She spent a lot of time throwing at distance. She didn't optimize her game plan there, didn't go for enough takedowns, didn't try and get on top. So I don't think that I have enough of a clear idea of what Macy Barber is going to bring to the table fight over fight. I thought at plus 175 last time I was willing to find out, but I'm not willing to find out at minus 200, minus 215. So I do think this is a very plausible buster of the week. I do think a lot of people like Chuke from that underdog perspective, but I do think, Rich, if people are playing it, they're going to go death taxes into Kagan by decision, which is possible, but I just don't think that that's the only way she can win the fight to the point that we made before, so I think money line's probably optimal here, um, and I do think there's a chance Caitlin could finish, but I also think there is a negative downside for Caitlin, which is she could get hurt to the body here. Um, you know, when I've looked in the past, the thing that bothered me in the Andrade fight, for like on rewatch, it's just her reaction to getting hit. Um, Andraj hits like a truck, right? She's a scary woman. But we did see she like spun in a circle and like was covering up and running away and shit. Looked like CJ Vergara against, uh, against uh, what's his name? Lacerda, right? Like she Lacerda. was just like doing the, the sprint away for a little while. That was concerning for me. But again, minus 141 for Jessica Andraj there. Minus 215 for uh, Macy Barber here. Something's not adding up about those lines to me. And the last Bro. thing I'll say as we move or uh, as I kick it back to you, Rich, she posted a picture that says I'm borrowing my stack from Gordon Ryan. She's got abs that are showing through her, uh, you know, like poking out. Right. And then Gordon comments, no more USADA with the eye emojis. I was just like, bro, are you just like openly cheating? Like I, I do appreciate it, though, if I'm going to bet you. Right. But um, that for me was something that was. Uh, was a little bit interesting. What did you think about that, Ray? <clears throat> yeah, just, uh, and I mean this with all respect, people can shut the fuck up about the body, man. She gets, you know, hit one time by Jessica Andrade, no less, and all of a sudden, you know, she's weak to the body because, um, you know, she got hurt by it once. Like, stop overstating stuff, man. Shut up. I'm not even saying that I think that she's, like, uh, soft to the body. I'm just saying I think that's, like, if I'm uh, in the corner of Macy Barber, I'm telling her to target that personally, just because that's where we've seen her get touched. But uh, oh, for sure, Bob is a retard though. Bro. Also, she, dude, she ain't doing that. The, the thing is, for the uh, for what we don't know about the miscarriage and whatever, that was the other thing that I just thought. Like, if you're being mean in a cage fight, you're punching in the body. This woman, like that's that's just what I would think. But, um, do you know what I think? Um, Bob is gonna do. She's gonna grapple her. 
she's going to grapple it and try and take her down. And she thinks she can get a fucking uh, TKO from Mount. And that's what I think, man. Um, I don't think she wants to stay at range. She's going to try and close the distance. And uh, that's why I like my submission bet, man. So take her down. Let's see what happens. There you have it. We'll find out. Next up, my man, we've got a great fight in the heavyweight division to round out the prelims. There are sharp guys I respect that completely disagree with me on this fight. Um, and I love to see that, right? That that always means that, uh, you know, it's going to be a competitively lined fight. There's going to be a lot of money in the market for this one. But the truth is, man, I spent a lot of time taping this fight. I spent a lot of time breaking down this fight in my mind before I parted ways with, with any dollars. And I just have a feeling Jalen Almeida is going to win this fight uh, upon more research, right? And when I looked at this, I say to myself, I'm not the biggest Curtis Blades guy. I'm not the best at handicapping Curtis Blades fights. So I wanted to give those disclosures up front. I'll let you guys know where I do well. I'll let you know where I do poorly. I have not done very well capping Curtis Blades fights. Um, however, I think Jelton Almeida is a guy I've had a pretty good read on throughout his UFC career. I had him at a plus 185 ticket, plus 550 to win by sub against Nasruddin Nasruddinov when nobody knew who this guy was. And I just said to myself, this guy looks like a million bucks physically. I think he comes in jacked on all the steroids in the world. And I also believe that this is a guy that we've seen grow into his body throughout his UFC tenure, right? When you look at the jujitsu world, when you look at these guys that grapple, that wrestle, I think they know something that I also know, which is the bigger you are, the less skills you have, right? It's just by and large true. You look, I used to dominate heavyweights in the wrestling room. I was 150 pounds, 160 pounds. I knew I was faster. I knew I was better at techniques and I knew that they couldn't catch me. So I would dominate them in those matchups. But when you look, sometimes the problem is if you get caught underneath, right? If somebody gets on top of you um, and they're just too big, they're too heavy. You can't really move them around. I feel like for Jailton Almeida, he showed in his last fight with Derek Lewis, a big guy who is not a great wrestler, right? Let's not mistake that. But he is a guy, Rich, that used to show up fat morbidly obese for his fights every time no problem but like it worked right if it ain't broke don't fix it but i listened to his interviews and he said i almost died before i fought uh sergey spivak like i passed out on the scale my coaches had to like hold me up um because he literally passed out trying to weigh in for a heavyweight fight okay he said the next day i had no strength in my body i felt like i was a limp noodle and this guy's just picking him up. If you guys remember that fight, Derek Lance, no strikes. He's getting thrown face first into the ground over and over. He's like, he's not even basing out on his hands. He's like, bing, just hitting his face on the ground, then gives up the choke. And he's like, just get me out of here. That was a wake up call for him. He said as much. He's like, for my health, I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm going to die if I keep doing this. He got on a diet. He shows up to fight Marco Socheria de Lima, looking 20 pounds uh, thinner with abs ready to go and kicks the guy, knees the guy in the face 10 seconds into the fight, flying through the air like an athlete for once. I was like, holy shit, Derek's back. Then you look and they book him against Almeida, okay? He shows up in shape for that fight. In my humble opinion, guys, he showed up highly motivated for that fight as well. Not something you could say about Derek Lewis at all times throughout his career. He showed up wanting to fight, wanting to win. He got taken down. He did not quit. He was in several deep submission attempts in, in the early portions. And what I believe is that Almeida went, I got 25 minutes that I might be stuck out here with this big lumbering guy who wants to kill me. I should not take any undue risks in this fight. So you see him get to the top position, throw a couple hammer fists. Derek does a big explosion. He's like, yeah, I'm never doing that again. Right. Then he realized I'm going to dominate positions. I'm going to try and go for my subs here and there. I'm going to go for a small ground and pound, but I'm not doing anything that's going to give this guy a huge lane. Did Derek have moments? Yes, he did. Derek got on top of him at one point, and I was like, oh, shit, that maybe this is it. Maybe he's going to fold up the tent, right? If he wanted to, he does fold up the tent. He did take five, six, seven big ground and pound shots, but what did he do? He grabbed a hold of him. He used his deep half guard. He went forward, backwards, rolled here. There. He's scrambling and making it hard to land clean shots. He's not an easy guy to hit on the ground. He's mobile and he's a scrambler. So then I said to myself, is this a guy that's going to settle on bottom position? No, is my answer. Based on what I've seen from him, I thought that he did a good job moving, staying mobile under a guy like Lewis. And by the way, guys, Derek Lewis landed seven. This is off the top of my head. So if I get this wrong, fuck off. But I believe seven <laughs> significant strikes to finish Curtis Blades. Okay. He didn't land 50 of them. He didn't land 100. He landed seven. And on the seventh, he never rose again, right? He was, uh, 
making terrible, dreadful noises in the cage for three, four minutes of being asleep, okay? When you look at that fight, that tells me, okay, seven significant strikes, he gets taken out of there. You could forgive it. It was a big bus driver uppercut. But let's also just say that's a common opponent. Nobody is, is seeming to give any credit to the fact that Jailton Almeida, what was his risk mitigation strategy? He went for takedowns. He got all of them that he needed. He had many, many takedowns throughout the fight. By the way, how many guys do you know that can wrestle for 25 minutes at heavyweight? I'll wait. Then you could go, look, can he do it? Uh, Curtis Blades can do it, right? Maybe, because what we saw from him is he wrestled 15 minutes against Volkov and then was ready to go into cardiac arrest. Dana White says after the fact, you want to talk shit before your fights and then fight like that. You should not do that because you're going to look stupid. Quote from Dana White about Curtis Blades. So one guy goes out there over five rounds, gasses out completely, and looks very vulnerable down the stretch. Hard to put him in a title fight. Hard to give him a big opportunity. How about uh, Jelton Almeida? The only thing that people came away with is this guy's more boring than I thought, or this guy didn't do as much as I would have hoped. Okay, but he didn't get knocked out, and he didn't make a fool of himself, and he didn't make a critical mistake. And the opposite's true for Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades got dropped by one of the 14 strikes that Mark Hunt landed in a fight that he won. That's off to him. But he is two and four career to the knockdown in the UFC. He's had many, many fights. Okay. The two guys that he's knocked down in the UFC are. Dawkins, who can't beat a black guy. Let's just call it the way it is. Not on the regional scene, not in the UFC. He's never beaten one. That's just a fact. Uh, they don't like cops uh, in the UFC, right? Derek Lewis is a felon. He was like, uh, I'm going to have to make you hold this one, right? When you look overall, I feel like this is a guy in Dawkins who does not like being in there with powerful punchers. And we've seen that on a number of occasions, right? Then you look, Alexi Olenek. Alexi Olenek is a former middleweight and he is... Like my height, I'm kidding, but like Alexi Olnick is not a very big, strong, intimidating guy for somebody like Curtis Blades. He's slower, he's way smaller, and he is a grappler. That's what he does. Unless he's getting the boa constrictor choke or, you know, a, a Ezekiel from bottom mount, shit's not going right for him in the heavyweight division. And he's 45 or whatever. So those are the knockdowns he's recorded in the UFC. He's been knocked down on four occasions. He's been knocked down by guys that, uh, you know, we have a common opponent. One guy got killed. The other guy won dominantly over 25 minutes. So everything for me is pointing to this guy, Jailton Almeida, has all three methods of victory to win this fight. Would I be surprised if he submitted Curtis Blades? Somewhat in the fact that he's never been submitted before. Who's the best grappler he's ever fought? Volkov? Like, seriously, like, who, who's the best one on the resume? Volkov when he was a brown belt? Like, I, I don't know. Not many great grapplers on the list. For a guy like Curtis Blades, not many great grapplers in the heavyweight division, period, point blank, in any uh, era of the UFC either. So I feel like this is a guy in Jelton Almeida who looked at a weight class that has no real grapplers, no real wrestlers, right? Curtis Blades is one of them. So let's see if he can do something about the takedowns that are coming at him on Saturday, right? But I'm not sure that he can because there's not a lot of evidence of guys trying and the guys that have tried have had success. Volkov had success. And he's not that good a wrestler. And he doesn't have the body type to wrestle either. And he's not very persistent with it. So he just outlasted Curtis over five and then started taking him down himself. Interesting look. How about Cody East? I know it's in 2016, but we have to look at the points of comparison we have. That's all we can do, right? I can't look at data that doesn't exist. But the data that does exist, the guy's falling over his own two feet. He's getting knocked over by Cody East. Cody East finishes the first round on top in his full guard. The thing I can tell you about Jelton Almeida is he's a good passer. He's had real jiu-jitsu matches with real jiu-jitsu guys in Brazil. He's had them in the gi. He's had them no gi. And he's done great in all of them that I've watched. So I'm like, is this guy a bad grappler? No, he's very good at grappling. Is he uh, more seasoned and experienced than Curtis Blades in the grappling positions? My answer is yes, he is. So then the question becomes, all right. Can he get takedowns? I think he can, and I think he will be much more reliable to shoot. This guy, Curtis Blades, attempts one takedown <laughs> against Derek Lewis and dies. He attempts one takedown against Pavlovich, doesn't get halfway to his hips. I don't think he's as good as advertised. So for me, give me chill to not made it here. How about you, Rich? Yeah, it's funny, man. I was just thinking people always say like we're a contrast of styles. You go for eight minutes and I've got like 30 seconds for this fight. Just funny to me, man. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you say, man. I'm on the Jailton side. Um, I agree with what you said, man. Speed kills. 
And uh, I have been waiting to fade Jailton for a minute. Um, I don't think he's a true heavyweight. He comes in at like 220, something like that. But I think he's fine. It'd be fine for this fight. I think after this fight, we're we'll trying to fade him. Um, you know, once he gets moved up in the rankings and he's now in the top five or whatever. But um, yeah, Blades, his interview I didn't like. He said he's a gatekeeper. He's happy to be the gatekeeper. I didn't like his attitude. And uh, he also said that he just wants to use his wrestling as defense. He doesn't want to offensively wrestle. So I didn't like that from him either. A bit of low IQ there. And I think Jouton's live for the TKO, man. Um, he said that he's only, you know, took people down and submitted them because it was the path of least resistance. So, um, yeah, when you've got someone like Blades, who's obviously a decent wrestler, he's a half decent, especially over three rounds. I think Jalton will know that and they try and keep it standing and test his stand up, man. It's like he's on this progression course where he subbed everybody and then he's had a five round now. So he's got that five round experience if he finally does get to a uh, championship fight. And um, yeah, now he's got someone in front of him where he can test his striking out because, um, you know, Blades is pretty elementary with his striking and uh, he could be chinny or it could just be that he's been fighting big fucking heavyweights, but. Like I said, speed kills, so I'm on the Jailton side, man. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both because I do think, like, let's just be serious, guys. It's a heavyweight fight. If Jailton gets knocked out, I'm not going to be altogether stunned because anybody could get knocked out at heavyweight. But I don't see evidence that he's less durable than this other guy, right? Like, I'm seeing evidence that this guy can't take as many clean shots as Jailton. How do I know? Jailton took 20 significant strikes from Derek Lewis, who looked like he was in shape. Some of them were from a standing position. He's like throwing hammer fists and punches straight at Jailton's head on the ground. And Jailton reacted fine. And the difference was one Marge Simpson bus driver uppercut. And my, my dude is sleeping for four minutes and like making harrowing, um, you know, uh, noises in the cage. Not for me. So, yes, I can say one time Jailton Almeida got knocked out on the regional scene. He was a young man on the come up. I can kind of forgive that. But we've seen him take big shots in the UFC and not go down. So now I'm looking at a guy in Curtis Blades who can't take the same big shots. He's getting put down in the first round on multiple occasions. He's closed as a favorite in a lot of fights where he loses. People love this guy. They love betting on him. They love getting behind him. But I think that he is just a little bit less than the sum of his parts. And I think Jailton Almeida, for better or worse right now in the heavyweight division, is a little bit more than the sum of his parts. So give me Jailton to get the job done. Next up, Rich. I've said a lot. I'll let you say what you've got to say about Piotr Jan taking on Yadong Song. Fun fight next up to start off the main card. Um, yeah, to be honest, I don't have too much, man. I keep this one simple. Um, I like the other fights on the main card, but not this one. I like Jan, man. I like buying the dip on him in this um, situation. I know his back's to the wall. He's lost a couple of fights, but Song, I don't think he's going to implement any kind of like wrestling or takedowns i think he's happy to stand um i didn't like his fight with cheeto vera i thought that he lost that fight i wouldn't say robbery i did at first look but you know i watched it again man and um you know i can see why they'd give it to song but i would have give it to vera so i didn't like that from him um he beat ricky simon big whoop um i put simon as a wrestler with an overhand right so i don't think that's anything to write home about and Jan, yeah, he's on the losing streak, but you could argue that he uh, won the fight against O'Malley. You know, people said it was a robbery. Again, I think it could have gone either way. Um, the Sterling fight was close also. So I don't think the losses are like indicative of what um, he brings to the table or where he's at in his career. He looks in good shape. I think in a stand-up fight against Song, he's live for the KO all day. I think it's like plus 500. So that's on the table. And... Um, yeah, I just like Yan, man. I just think it's going to be a stand-up fight, and he's better, more technical um, than Song. Um, yeah, Song hits hard, but, you know, it's a big, big whoop. I think that's all he's got. I think the technical aspect is just too much in Yan's favor, and um, I think he's live for the KO, man. I think it's a nice price on him as well. He wins this one. You're going to see him at, what, minus 200, minus 250 again in his next fight. So minus 120 range is, uh, is nice for Yan, man. You know, Rich, this is one of the first times I've ever considered betting on Piotr Jan in the UFC, right? And uh, I think that you hit the nail on the head for a lot of the reasons why. Um, I think there is a chance that this line is being colored by recency bias. Um, when you look, Piotr Jan's a guy I faded routinely, right? And it's not to say I thought he was bad. 
but he was being priced like he was 70% against a lot of these guys in the division, to your point. And I was like, I don't buy that, right? I don't see that. And so the one that I made a, a critical mistake, I took Corey Sandhagen plus 225. He ended up getting killed, right? That was not a very close fight in the end. I thought he competed well for the first round, but by the end, he's getting hit with the, you know, tornado punches, kicks, you know, knocked all over the place. And if you listen to what uh, Corey said about these two guys, I thought that was interesting, right? Common opponent. Um, so I, I wanted to hear what he had to say. He said Song is a more powerful puncher than Piotr Jan, but Piotr Jan had good setups. He had good uh, spins, abilities. Like he just kind of confused Corey. And if you look, Corey's dummied a bunch of guys, right? Like he's gone out there and made a, a few guys look very silly in their fights, including title challenger Chito Vera, right? He just made him miss all night, made him uh, work all night, and then had a lot of great success with his stand-up and his striking in that fight. And he was setting the table for himself. When you look at how uh, Piotr Jan tends to fight, he likes to do kind of the same thing, right? Early on in the fight, he's finding his reads. He's trying to move a little bit, see what you're throwing out at him. And then he starts trying to throw back his counters. He starts trying to line you up for big shots. Now, the things that I liked about Song Yudong historically, he's a strong starter. He comes out, he gets in your face. He's willing to go right from Jump Street and get on somebody, right? He actually got uh, Julio Arce. One of the only times I faded Song in the UFC, I thought Julio Arce just had the, the skills, the tools to make it a hard fight over 15 minutes. Never got there, right? He got off. He got after him very early in that fight, landed big shots. So I think of a guy like Song Yudong as a powerful puncher, but let's just say last time out, he disappointed me, Rich. I thought he had a free fight. I thought he had a, a great opportunity to go out there and finish a guy that he's higher level than. He didn't do it, right? He, he took the five rounds of experience. He got that under his belt. Nothing wrong with that, but that did bring some questions up in my mind. Like if this was Piotr Jan, if this was a five round fight against Piotr Jan on the night, was he going to win that fight? And I think the answer was no, um, based on what he showed at least that night. So he's still a guy that we don't know his age, but we think he's a young enough guy to continue to make some improvements, fight over fight. He does train with team alpha male and some guys that are trying to give him good looks and a good push. But when I look at a guy like Piotr Jan, I was taking Aljamain Sterling against him on the premise that he was going to mitigate rounds, grappling upside, body triangle. A lot of the things that ended up playing out in that fight, plus 270, very proud of that bet, one of my favorite bets of all time. Another fight that I was really proud of was taking Marab Devajvili, plus 225. Good luck finding that one again. Not coming back for a long time, right? He pushes too high of a pace. He has too much to offer. And he's from the same fucking team as Alger. Like, this team, Sarah Longo, was 2-0 and against the guy. I'm like, what, am I going to fade him at 3-0 and to go 3-0 and when they've got Marab, who's the guy that they say is next up? No, I just thought he was too much. But that was also a fight, Rich, where you talk about the motivation. Marab demolished Billy. How was I not going to bet him when he says before the fight, I will kill myself if I lose to Piotr Jan? Yo, I'm not saying that you could like that, love that. I just know that that man was not quitting on me. He's not going in there and fucking phoning it in. He was giving everything he had to win that fight on the night. Georgia against Russia, right? My man could not lose, right? He was not going back to Georgia a loser that night. I'm just saying this. Song Yudong is a guy that has lost in, uh, you know, Russian promotions before, right? He has been clipped, hurt, knocked out. I didn't even see that footage until this fight week doing my research. So could I see him get beat in this fight? Yeah. I mean, I do think Piotr Jan, 31 years of age, maybe he gets clipped. Maybe the, the show's over. But how often do we see guys lose four fights in a row that are elite bantamweights? Not very common, right? It's just not, it's not easy to get over on good fighters multiple times in a row. And the guys that have done it, they're number one, two, three in the division. Like, it's just like guys that have really been proving commodities. Sean O'Malley fighting for the title, the current champion. Uh, Marab Devalishvili, the challenger in waiting. Everybody says he deserves the next crack of the shot. It's like, these are not low-level guys. Aljamain Sterling, he's the last champion of the division. And the one before that was Piotr Jan. So I think this is an impressive guy. Um, I don't think he's ready to be done with his career. The one thing I want to do is make sure that he's not talking about leaving the UFC. Because I will say, if he is dead set on leaving the UFC, which some people have told me before, he said it. After the O'Malley fight, fuck these guys. They're screwing me. I'm getting out of here. If he is going to leave the UFC, the UFC don't want you to leave on top. That's one thing I know for sure. They will try and bury you. If that's the reason they booked the fight, so be it. Maybe I'll have to just stay away. But um, I'm I'm hoping the line flips here, Rich. I do think there's a lot of public sentiment behind Song Yudong. And if I get plus money on Piotr Jan, I might have to take a speculative investment there uh, and hope for the best. But 
two guys I like and respect. Um, I've been on the song side more, but I just think that this is a big ask of him. This is a step up in competition, and I think Piotr Jan could get the win here. I think he could be being disrespected. So for me, probably leaning towards playing Jan or passing on this fight. Anything you wanted to add here? Um, no, just as you're talking, though, I'd say that Song is going to give him the fight that he wants. Like you mentioned, Marab. Um, obviously, there was the takedown threat, but he never gave, gave chance um, Yan a chance to reset, which we know he likes to do. And I think Song's just going to make it a low-paced sparring match where, you know, that's going to give Yan all the chance to, you know, reset, get his striking going, and fuck him up, man. I think Yan probably dominates it, to be honest. There you have it. So, Rich, with the bold take. Next up, my man, we got Gilbert Terrino Burns and Jack Della Maddalena. I have no bets on this fight yet. Um, my gut feeling says that Jack is going to get the job done here. Um, I do see a lot of love in terms of uh, public bettors uh, on my Twitter account, things like that. And some sharp bettors I respect as well that are taking the shot on Gilbert Burns. Um, it's not to say that Gilbert can't win the fight. He is obviously very talented with his jiu-jitsu. We've seen in the past. That's the one thing that's given me cause to fade Jack Della Maddalena, right? I said that I believe uh, Basel Hafez was not a pushover. I thought Basel Hafez was going to make that a close and competitive fight. He made it a close and competitive fight, right? He fought him tooth and nail the whole time. JDM also made a bunch of boneheaded mistakes in that fight, in my view, going for the guillotines. I've said it a million times. You want to go for the guillotine, you can't end up in a worse position than you started. That's the only thing that makes a guillotine bad is if you end up in a negative position. If you go with a, uh, you know, elevator hook and you're ready to sweep somebody over and get back to the front headlock, then you can go for a guillotine anytime. But what he was doing was he was committing all out to the offense and that leaves you flat on your back if it doesn't work out. In MMA, too risky a situation to do that. So when I think about this fight, I say to myself, this is a little bit of an IQ test for him, right? Basel Hafez, you can afford to take more risks. You can afford to do more boneheaded things along the way without it costing you the fight. But I do think you don't want to get in there with a shark on the mat like Gilbert Burns and start making mistakes or fucking about and going for your own shit. I think that what we've seen from Jack is a guy that is very dangerous on the feet. And also, I don't think he's a quitter, Rich. Like, I, I do think when I want to fade somebody – uh, with a submission threat. I want the, the person to give up if the going gets tough. Neil Magny, I thought was the perfect mark for Gilbert Burns, not because he's like a guy that doesn't want to fight or he's going to easily give up. He just didn't have the skills to stop him. We saw RDA go out there, take him down, pass the guard routinely, easy finish from the top position. What did Gilbert do? The exact same thing. He just replicated that game plan to a T. But the one thing I noticed, Rich, looking back at the uh, resumes of these guys, who has Gilbert Burns out grappled at 170 pounds. Wonder Boy and Neil Magny are those exemplary wins that tell me that this guy's grappling translates at welterweight? No, he's relying on his hands to go with, uh, you know, the Tyron Woodleys and whatever the division. He attempts a million takedowns, doesn't get any of them. So I feel like Gilbert is a little bit overrated in terms of his wrestling and his grappling at the 170 pound class. Could he show another layer there? Could he go out there and prove more this weekend? Yes, he could. But this would be his best submission win at 170 pounds by far. Prior to that, like except that fight against Neil Magny, he hasn't submitted anybody, I don't believe, since Mike Davis in 2019. Mike Davis is 155 pounder. He submitted a couple 155 pounders. But the last time he fought an Australian, he got knocked the hell out in the first round by Dan the Hangman Hooker. And he got sent packing from a, the weight class. Hey, get the hell out of here. Go find a new one. So I think that if there's a 165-pound division that opens up, maybe we see Gilbert be more competitive. He's a little bit of a tweener, right? He could cut five, ten more pounds, I believe. But I don't know that this is a guy that is physically dominant enough to beat these guys at 170 consistently. Bilal Muhammad, very well-rounded fighter, but he completely shut down the game of Gilbert. And if you remember, Rich, we were very gung-ho on Bilal Muhammad on the show, both of us, and he was fucking injured, so we got scared and we didn't bet it. And he still whooped his ass so easily, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. So I just think that when I look at this fight, I think the Kamzat Chemaev hangover is still there a little bit for Gilbert Burns. I think people give him a lot of credit for that. But we also saw when Chemaev doesn't get people out of there in the first seven and a half minutes, eight minutes, he starts going into risk mitigation. He starts going into decision mode. That's kind of what he's done against Kamaru Usman as well. So. This is a guy that's been dropped with jabs. This is a guy who's been hurt, rocked, wobbled many times in his career. 
I feel like Jack Della is going to get to the chin and hurt him. How do you feel, Rich? Yeah, Shemaev made it look like Burns could strike in that fight, man. It was crazy. Um, I think that the sharp play is probably Jack by decision. Um, I said at the beginning of the week that, you know, this was binary, which I still think it is. I think that, you know, Burns is going to go for his takedowns. He said that in his interview or alluded to that in his interview. Um, there's no secret there. We turn against that Basil guy. You know, Jack shows a deficiency in the uh, the grappling. So obviously that's Burns' best bet, but I just don't know whether he can get it there. You know, we've seen in the um, Bilal fight that he wasn't able to, um, you know, dominate in the wrestling or even um, get his takedowns going, man. So, um, yeah, I think the sharp plays Jack by decision, um, to be honest. The unders are shit anyway. The prices um, are. So, yeah, it's kind of picky poison. Who do you want, man? Do you want Jack by the KO or do you want uh, Burns by the sub? I'd go for neither. Uh, I'd be the contrarian and say Jack by decision. It's plus 350. So that's my official pick. But this isn't a fight I want anything to do with, man. It's too, um, there's too much risk on both sides. You know, obviously, I think Burns is a bit chinny. I don't think his hands are all there. And then we've seen with Jack, he can get taken down. And if you're going to get taken down by the likes of Burns, you're going to probably get subbed, man. Um, the difference between the jiu jitsu is uh, just too much of a gap. So, um, yeah, I think Jack can keep it standing, but I just don't think he finds his KO, man. I think he's um, too wary of the takedown threat, doesn't throw as much, and just squeaks out a decision, man. That's I got to find out if Craig Jones, the king of the nose beers, is going to be in the building uh, on Saturday night, because if so, I do think he said a lot of really nice things about Jack Della's grappling, and I don't think he was being full of shit. You know, like I've heard him talk about some guys grappling and just be like, yeah, they're okay. Or like, you know, yeah, he's a strong guy. Um, but he said like, this guy is really dangerous with his sub threats in the gym uh, and not easy for people to submit either. And the one thing I'll note um, as we move off this fight is that I did bet one time against Jack Della and it was Angelusa. If you remember that fight on contender series, he got him in a very deep head and arm choke and Jack just yep. showed no signs of wanting to quit there at all. Like for me, I think that you can't tough guy a choke, right? If Gilbert puts him in a really serious head and arm choke, he's probably going to sleep. I don't think he's tapping though. Based on what I've seen from him, he seems like a guy who's like, I'm going to stay here, try and stay patient, try and find my way out of this. And if you let me out, I'm going to kill you. Like you shouldn't have tried to do this shit. And that was the thing that I found impressive, right? Why did I like Volk and respect him so much? Um, because Brian Ortega puts him in a deep, deep sub attempt and he doesn't just come out of it and like survive. He comes out and beats the hell out of you. He's like, oh, you want to go for subs now? Let, let's see what that's all about. And the same thing happened, JDM Angelusa. He gets out of the sub, pops right back up to his feet, and he's like, oh, that, that, that didn't work out. Now you're a little tired in the arms. Let's see how you feel now. And he started throwing shot, 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 shot. I think he knows where his bread is buttered, and I think as soon as he has opportunities on the feet, he's going to try and deliver. So for me, lean is towards the under. Uh, I do think both guys capable of finishing, but I think JDM a little bit more dangerous at this point in his career. So give me JDM to get the win. <clears throat> Next up, my man, weird fight, fun fight. Call Big Mouth, Kevin Holland. He's back in the building. And I thought that you had a, a great breakdown uh, on your show for this fight, Rich. Um why don't you go ahead and start us off? We've got Michael Venom Page making his UFC debut. Very good record. I think 17-2 and two over in Bellator. So people can scoff at it all they want. A lot of enhancement talent along the way. But 21-2, and two, that's a very solid MMA record to put together, even if you're fighting tomato cans. Uh, how do you feel, Rich? Yeah, interested to see who the chat are picking, man, between these two. Because I do think it's, um, you know, got Twitter divided this, this fight. But... Um... To be honest, I can't even remember what I said on my show. Uh, I know I like MVP. Um, I think I remember saying Holland. He hasn't been right since the Shamaya fight. Um, being Chiesa doesn't mean shit. Or Ponzinibbio, who's washed, doesn't mean shit. And um, yeah, Holland, he just... Uh, I don't know, man. You've seen him against Wonderboy. He had him down. Path of least resistance. Should have jumped on him. Got the grappling going. Didn't want anything to do with it. Um, and yeah, I just think it's going to be the same in this MVP fight. I think his ego is going to get the better of him. He's going to stand. Um, I've seen them hugging and shit in the uh, corridors on fight week. That usually alludes to some, uh, you know, hugging, some high fives in between rounds and the rest of it. So MVP by decision um, seems likely to me. Uh, Kevin doesn't really get KO'd. Um, 
so, so yeah, that's pretty much it, man. I just think Kevin, since he got paid, man, he probably got a quarter of a mil for that Shamaya fight with like the late notice. And, um, you know, he was talking about retirement. I don't know whether he was joking about that, but he mentioned it. And I just think money changes a person, especially somebody like him, man. And um, yeah, I think he's just here now for the, the clout, um, the fun of it, the sport of it. And, uh, you know, I don't think he's got any aspirations for a title or anything. He's just he's just here to bang and uh, have fun, man. And uh, MVP's taking it serious. You know, um, he's a good scoop for the UFC. Um, Pay-per-view start or could be. Flashy finishes. Um, talk's a good game. You can put him on the UK cards. So I hate to say this is what the UFC wants because it's cringe as fuck. But I do think they've set this fight up for MVP to win. So it's on him now to deliver. Um, so, yeah, I like the MVP side, man. Yeah, I think it's important to know what the UFC wants, right? They don't always get what they want, right? Francis Ngannou left on yeah. top. But they can always try and set up their situations to be beneficial for themselves, right? And I do think... Uh, I've mentioned this before, but I think they've kind of put themselves in a little bit of a no-lose situation here, right? Kevin Holland's a company guy. He's been around a long time, done a lot of jobs for the company. And so I think he's the right guy at the right time to, to call in for this spot. Because on the one hand, if he wins here, it's like, oh my God, this MVP guy that you all thought was the truth, he's a fugazi. On the other hand, it's like, if he loses here, He's lost a million times, so he's easily a rebuildable guy. He's been in multiple weight classes. He's kind of fluid in that way. You can move him up to 185, move him to 170, do a catch weight here, there, or anywhere, and he just says yes to all these opportunities, right? Um, I think part of that's financial. I think my man's just like, let me get as much money as I can. They pay me pretty well to do these fights. I'll run it out there with anybody. Don't think he's afraid to fight these guys either. You know, Kevin is about that life, but when it comes down to it, He's not a optimal fighter, right? He doesn't give himself the best chance to win. I hate betting on those guys. When you look, I've made a lot of money betting on Kevin Holland. One of my most profitable fighters ever, Rich. I think like 20 units of profit on this guy. Like I've done very well, but my, my read on Kevin is getting less and less clear over time. The reason being, he's not the same guy he used to be. He used to try and win, but you could very easily predict the things that he couldn't do. Can't stop somebody from taking him down to 185, right? Can't stop big, strong guys from ripping him to the ground. So you give me Derek Brunson at plus 150, we're going to find out, right? Like these are the kind of spots where I'm willing to go fade Kevin Holland. But when you're looking at this fight, I say to myself, I can't not, like I can't lay chalk on Kevin Holland based on what we know right now. Against Wonder Boy, he's got every opportunity to wrestle and grapple and just leaves it on the table, right? Just fumbles that bag. That was a costly loss, right? That was his friend. They filmed tequila to commercials and all this shit. So is he really serious about winning or is he not? In that fight, it showed me he was not very serious about winning. Meanwhile, you got a guy who's 21 and two as a professional. Is that guy fucking serious about winning or not? Whether you like his strategy or not, he picked, managed every fight along the way to make sure he had a good winning record. Kevin has 10 professional losses. He did the opposite. Fight you at 185, fight you on short notice, fight you at 170, fight you here, there, or anywhere. And is it like he blew everybody out of the water that he was better than? Fuck no. Alex Cowboy Oliveira's on his back. My man's doing the smile and the thumbs up and this and that. Um, half these guys, he had a chance to win, right? He hurt um, Derek Brunson on the feet, but he couldn't stop the takedowns. He couldn't continue. He couldn't follow up. And Dana and these guys have already expressed fatigue with his gimmick, with his talking shit, with his being out there and being aloof. That's going to keep you around as like a fun TV action fighter. Not going to keep you in prime positions where they want to promote you and move you up the card because they know they put him in these big moments, these big opportunities, main events. He's fumbled the bag on a number of occasions. He's let them down in big spots. And so he does a lot of things right for the company to be a company guy, but he doesn't do enough to win fights consistently to justify laying minus 130 prices in my view. And the last thing I'll mention here, I want to shout out Dan Hardy and the Outlaw uh, Picks podcast that he did. They said in Team Renegade, this guy is very highly respected. Nobody wants to strike with this guy. Everybody thinks that he's extremely dangerous and extremely talented. And he's training with world champions. He's not training with bums. He's not training with average fighters. So I think at Team Renegade, he's probably continuing to get better. And he's been working a little bit in silence. I don't give a shit that he lost to fucking Mike Perry. Like Mike Perry is beating up Luke Rockhold, a former UFC 185 pound champion. What are we talking about? It's a bare knuckle fight. Who gives a shit? I think that this is a fight where he can win. And I think that he's probably the side at plus money. So for me, um, 
if I was to take anything on the Holland uh, end of the spectrum, I would take the ends by submission. I know people won't talk about that. I would say Kevin Holland by sub at plus 700 is not a better bet than the fight ends by sub plus 600. Michael Venom Page has never been submitted before. It's possible it could happen here. Kevin's got limb length. He is a dangerous grappler. Travis Luter, black belt. Is he a super prevalent grappler? Does he go out there and force the issue every time? No, he counter grapples. He reacts to other people grappling. And by the way, Michael Page, not known for his grappling, not known for his wrestling. I wouldn't say he's very high level with those things. But is he opportunistic as a catch submission artist? Yes, he is. He has submitted people before in professional MMA competition on a number of occasions by just grabbing a hold of something and trying to rip it off, trying to leverage a move really quickly. And Kevin makes mistakes. He does put himself in negative grappling situations at times. So I'd much rather sacrifice $1 on my return than go out there and have Kevin get rear naked choked by this guy and be fucking embarrassed. Um, so that's my long and short thoughts of it. Hooey! Next up, brother. We've got the co-main event of the evening, Dustin the Diamond Poirier against Benoit Saint-Denis. And I'll take this one first, Rich. I know you got a lot to say here, but I'll be brief. You know, I'll just say I like both these guys. Uh, I respect both their game. But for me, I think they're two guys moving in opposite directions, right? I think on the one hand, I've seen Dustin Poirier at the top of the mountain. I've seen him fight for world titles. I've seen him in big opportunities, big fights. But I have literally seen the regression in him over time. Justin Gaethje, he went blood and guts. It's one of the best fights you'll ever see the first time they fought, right? People won't remember the first time they fought, they went to war and he was getting kicked in the leg. He's getting brutalized. He's getting beat up. And he just found a way to keep pushing, keep pushing. And he broke Justin Gaethje, a tough man, a brutal man, a guy who's willing to be in those hard fights. He broke him. He beat him up. He finished him. That's an impressive showing. That's a man. That's a champion right there. That's a guy who can compete at the highest levels. But what we've also seen is he got that opportunity to go back and do it again, this time with a belt on the line. And that has been a death nail throughout his career. You put a belt on the line, you make it a more serious fight, falls off the cliff, right? Ends up getting knocked out in brutal fashion within two rounds. But the other thing, Rich, I didn't think he looked very good competing in the prior round. I didn't think he looked like he was, you know, uh, on pace to winning that fight. I thought it was a fight where it was starting to get away from him a little bit early. Then he gets finished. Maybe that he could have turned it around. We've seen him in rounds three, four, five, turn it around on people before, but I don't know that you can keep finding that magic. Dan Hooker almost had this guy out of there on multiple occasions. And he did turn him back. He did find a way to push to that second, third, fourth gear, but that was after sustaining an incredible beatdown. And then Dan Hooker didn't have very much left to give. Right. He was still taking him down. He's still getting uh, after his grappling, but he really just had nothing left to offer in the striking. He hadn't been five rounds. Uh, so I think he just was out of gas too early in that fight and got the hell beaten out of him, got sent to the hospital. You've seen Dustin Poirier pour out that jug how many times from 145 to 155. This man has given you everything inside the octagon. And now I think you're hearing that in his interviews. Right. You're hearing hesitancy about being in that place, about going back there. He's saying, I know a lot of these guys are broke. I know a lot of these guys, they don't have money. I know a lot of these guys, they're broken physically. And I don't want to end up like that. You know, he's saying, every time I go in there, I lose a piece of myself. How many pieces does you think you want to give up at this age, at this point when he's a millionaire, right? He's got a lot of fucking money. He's trained in South Florida for a long time. I think there's going to be a lot of support for him in that building. For people saying, hey, Dustin, it's been a great time. It's been a great run. Let, let's call it here, brother. Let's not get hurt anymore. We ain't got to be in there with these fucking young kids who are trying to take your head off. We ain't got to be in there with these special forces operators want to rip your goddamn head off. I think that this is a guy in Dustin Poirier who's done everything in the sport and he has nothing left to do. I don't think he has anything left to give. He's already on his second weight class. He said as much as I can't go up to 170. These guys are too big. I have already seen it. I've gone in the training room. If I was to show up at 170, I would weigh 172 pounds and cut one pound, two pounds. That's it. He's like, it's just not for me. I can't do that. He's like, I know what these guys are like. They're going to come in 185. They're going to come in 190. This guy, Benoit Saint-Denis, I think is very big, strong, physical. I think he can grapple. I think he can strike with Dustin as well. So for me, the question is, does Dustin Poirier knock this man out? Can he do that? Can he catch him in a guillotine one time for the culture? 
If he can't do those things, I think he's going to be in there with a guy who wants it more, who's fresher, who can take more, who can be in the fire for longer. And I think he stays focused in that fire as well. I think we've seen at times Dustin Poirier check out mentally when fights start to get tough. And I know that's hard to say about a guy who's this tough and this proven, but you look at the Khabib fight. He broke mentally. He gave up. He he lost the fight. Charles Oliveira, he got hurt to the body. He broke mentally. He gave up and he turned his back and lost the fight. And by the way, I was there for a bunch of those to bet against him. I've never bet on Dustin Poirier one time in his career. So that's my full disclosure biases, right? I've not been a Dustin Poirier fan like that, but I've made a lot of money betting on unders in his fights, betting on violence in his fights, betting the ends by sub in his fight against Michael Chandler, for example. Done, done well betting on Dustin Poirier at times, but I think that the bills come and do. I think Benoit St. Denis' time is now. How about you, Rich? Um. Yeah, I had Benoit as the uh, mush of the week. I like Dustin. Uh, I thought he'd get it done. But yeah, the same as what you're saying, man. I watched some interviews, and it was his most recent interview, man. Um, the one with MMA Junkie, where he was asked about the confusion, you know, when the fight was announced by the UFC, and he came out and said, that the fight isn't on what you were talking about. And then like a couple of hours later, he was like, right, fight's back on. They asked him about that. And I can't remember the word he used. It was something like, it was just miscommunication. That was the word. And then he had a follow-up question and somebody said, Gilbert Burns said you got paid a bag for this fight. Um, and that's why you, um, you know, came out a few hours later and said the fight's back on. Is there any truth to that? And he like took a minute and he, um, I think he said no comment or something like that. But he basically told me that, yeah, that's true. That's the only reason he's here. He didn't want to fight. He didn't want to accept the fight with um, Benoit. And, um, yeah, when the UFC's dangling, what, fucking, I don't know, 400K in front of you, half a million, whatever it might be, um, you know, a chance to promote all your businesses, which I've seen Dustin doing on Instagram all week. Um, you know, he's wearing this fight gear. He's got you know, money and clothing brands and whiskeys and all sorts of shit. Um, you know, hot, hot sauce out the down. wazoo. Hot sauce, all that shit. So I literally think that's the situation, man. And that's why I cashed out of my bet. I know I've made the right decision. Um, you know, I've done this twice now in, uh, I think the space of, uh, 30 days, the last like month, I think Henry was the last one. And it's fucking annoying, man. When, when you make an early bet on someone, you get to fight week, there's injury talk, or you watch an interview and you hear something. I was justified in the Henry cash out. He lost the fight, looked like shit. Um, it was true that he had an injury, hadn't been training. And I know full well I'm justified in this fight. Dustin will not win this fight. Um, yeah, he's got a uh, shot at pulling a guillotine when Benoit goes for his takedowns, but it's not going to hit, man. He doesn't want to be here. Um, I think the sharp play is... Benoit by decision. I think um, that's a nice price. It's like 700, 750. And um, yeah, I think the UFC made this five rounds for a reason, similar to like they did with Jelton and Derek Lewis. I think it's to give Benoit experience in five round fights. They seem to be pumping him up. Um, you know, his trajectory in the UFC since he came in. And um, yeah, people have said, man, I'm, a f I'm no fucking hater of... Um, Benoit man at all I've cashed as much money as anybody else on him I had the sub against fucking Bonfim I had him against Moises and all that kind of shit but every fight's different I know how you beat the guy Dustin if he was here and he wasn't here just showing up he's got all the two tools to beat him man um Benoit's average in my opinion yeah he's special forces which I'm sick of fucking hearing he's tough as fuck fair play um it's all true but I don't think his jiu-jitsu is all that good. I think if he fights somebody with decent jiu-jitsu, he's going to get subbed. He's nearly got guillotined in pretty much two of his fights against Stolze and Miranda. Um, they both tried locking up a guillotine on him. He leaves his head on the outside. And um, yeah, I even seen Miranda double leg him, man, and put him on his back. Fair play, he got back up. Um, so yeah, I just think he's got holes in his game. I don't think his striking's up to much. When I first looked at this matchup against um, Dustin, I thought, well, Dustin's a southpaw, so that body kick isn't going to be on that he likes to throw. Um, you know, that's not going to open up on a southpaw, so that's kind of nullified. 
So what does that leave? Uh, just Ben White to take him down pretty much and um, try and maul him. But yeah, I think Justin's going to stay safe. Um, I like the overs. I like the decision for Benoit. Um, I think that's a sharp angle, man. So that's the way I'd look at the fight. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, and I think that we have a, a potential shoey here as well, which is, um, hmm. if, uh, you know, we can predict the method, right? Because my guy, Rich, thinks that it's going to be Benoit Saint-Denis by decision. I'm actually going to go ahead and predict Benoit Saint-Denis by knockout in this fight. I think that uh, Dustin Poirier, his chin is starting to go just a little bit. I don't know that the durability is there. And I think that if he starts to get into the fire here, it might just turn into wrist ride and bing, bing, bing. Unlike Tiago Moises where he hopped on the choke, I think it could just be as simple as rolling wrist, punching him until the referee is forced to intervene, stop it on behalf of a guy that people like, guy that people don't want to see take a lot of damage. That's something that I can see happening here. And the other thing I'll mention is that head kick. Last time out against Fervola, I called Benoit Saint-Denis by KO1 or split decision. And the reason I felt that way is just because I thought it was going to be a really frenetic fight. I thought if they got into crazy scrambles, it could end up being Fervola gets on top, Benoit Saint-Denis gets on top. We saw a little bit of that in the short fight that played out. But what we also saw is that the pressure that this guy exerts on people, they start to make mistakes. Matt Fervola is not a guy that would traditionally put his hands down and turn to run away from somebody. But he was like, I, I need to get some space. I need to get some uh, you know, feet underneath me because he's getting backed up. And then he just never saw the head kick coming. And I think that's exactly what happened against Gaethje last time. I don't think Poirier ever saw that head kick when he got dropped by it. So for me, I think that if Benoit is able to distract, to use that body kick, um, which will be a little different in this stance matchup. But I think he's going to set the table with the body kick as he did against Bonfim. And I think he's going to go upstairs and close the show. So give me Benoit Saint-Denis inside the distance. There's the only disagreement that we have on this one. But I'm glad that you came around to Benoit Saint-Denis because this is a big weekend for French MMA. The PFL is going on right now. They've got two top up-and-coming French prospects, including one in Cedric Dumbe that Dana tried to sign, fumbled the bag, right? I think that they would love to have a big presence in France, a growing market, a huge economy in Europe. And by the way, they legalized MMA two, three years ago. They've already brought how many shows there? They already gave Cyril Ghan a title fight, even though he was clearly not ready. I think when you look at French MMA talent, there's not many guys that I could say have a honest chance of winning a world title. And I do believe that Benoit Saint-Denis is that guy. So whether he wins it or not, he's still got to go deliver, right? He's got a lot of hard assignments between now and then. But I think the market reflects they are going to try to give this guy an opportunity if they can. And I do think he will fight very hard for your dollar against any man uh, in the UFC. So with that being said, my brother, it is main event time. 365 people rocking with us live. Appreciate each and every one of you guys doing so. Somebody just said Cedric Dumbe just lost right now. Injured his fight, injured his foot in the third and couldn't fight on. I will say Baki, the guy who just beat him then, is another top French prospect. So somebody to keep your eye on. Um, didn't have any bets on that fight, but fascinating. And thank you for the update. Now we're on to the main event, Rich. We got a bantamweight title fight. We got Sugar Sean O'Malley, the talk of the town, the rainbow hair. Is he going to get the job done or is Marlon Chito Vera going to claim one for Ecuador? It has been the year of the new champion. It has been the year of the underdog in the UFC main event. It has been the year of a country claiming a new champion, right? South Africa gets their first breakout champion. Hey, Congratulations to Drickus Duplessis. We were there for the coins. Ilya Teporia, first one for Spain, breaks through for Georgia, breaks through for all the demographics he represents. My man checks every freaking box uh, demographically that you could possibly think of. He's done a great job for himself, um, setting himself up. Can Chito Vera do the same thing for Ecuador? I don't know. I think that this is a fascinating matchup. I do think it's interesting to me that, you know, the press pool from Ecuador is rolling like 50 deep to support this guy. That does seem like he's got the backing of his home country. It seems like people are excited and, and ready to get behind him, but he's still got to do the damn thing, right? He's still got to go out there against the guy in O'Malley who is a technical striker and a guy that I've underrated historically, Rich. I wasn't there for the plus 200 against Pierre Jan. I wasn't there for the plus 200 against my guy, Aljamain Sterling, guy I really like, guy I met in person, very nice guy. And I thought that there's no way I could lay minus 230 against an O'Malley in Boston. But that was the only thing I knew for sure when this guy was fighting for the title. Now he goes out there and gets to call his shot as champion, get the rematch that he wanted against Chito Vera. So for me, 
This is a fight that Sean wants. It's a fight that Sean called for right away when right? he got the title. And I think the UFC obliging him tells you they like this guy. They want to support him. But it doesn't mean that he's going to go out there and get the job done. Interesting fight. Fascinating matchup. What do you got, Rich? Do you know why he called for Vera? Out of anyone else he could have in the division. Like Marab. Uh, I think because he's not going to wrestle. Yeah, because he's, he's a little bitch. He thinks this is the path of least resistance. He thinks he can point fight, uh, skirt on the outside in the big cage and uh, win his way to his decision. That's why he chose um, Vera. And I hope it blows up in his stupid face, man, because he's an idiot. Can't stand him. Can't stand the fans that he brings to the sport. Um, I hate everything about him, man. He's, um, you know... Everything about him, man. Fucking the cheating on his wife, all the fucking threesome shit. Just his disrespect towards everybody. I seen him this week with Cheeto, um, saying, "Are you ready to get knocked out?" <laughs> and and Cheeto said, "Are you ready to suck my dick?" And then he was like, "Well, that's weird." It's like, yeah, I just don't like the guy, man. But in terms of the fight, I don't know why people are laying this kind of chalk on O'Malley. He's never been in a five rounder. Yeah. He uh, had the one against Sterling, but it ended in the first round, so whatever. Was it first round, second round? First round? Uh, the fight with Sterling, I think, was second round. Second round. Anyway, it wasn't extended. It wasn't in the championship It was early round. in the second round, too. It was not a long fight. Yeah, it was It was early, man. You seen him in the Yan fight. He was fucking blowing in that one, man. Um, you know, he had to control his breathing or whatever. He was getting tagged by Yan, um, who was at a serious uh, metrics disadvantage. We've seen him be brittle. We've seen him, um, you know, get injured seriously in two fights, the one against Vera and the one against um, Soccer Mom, uh, however you pronounce his name. So the guy's brittle, man. Um, I don't like that from him. I think in this fight, he's going to be scared to throw the kicks. You know, he can say whatever he wants. You know, he's disguised it in the past or he's tried to say it's an over-exaggerated thing, um, you know, him and the leg kick situation. But... I think he's going to be timid, man. We've seen that against Pedro. Um, it seemed to me like Pedro shut him down in round one. Um, and yeah, he was doing well, Pedro. Pedro, again, was at a serious metrics disadvantage. Sean, he's a long rangey, skinny fucker. Um, and he just looked a bit timid in that fight. Like he didn't know what to do. He didn't have like a plan B um, if someone's able to put it on him. And Vera's going to have five rounds to do that. We know Vera's durable. I don't see O'Malley knocking him out at all. You know, I even feel a bit ashamed, man. I even said before, when I picked O'Malley to KO Sterling, I was like, yeah, he's going to knock Sterling out. He's going to call Vera for the rematch and he's going to win a decision. Um, but yeah, since seeing stuff like transpire since then, that this is why I'm switching up my bet and I'm on Vera. Um, I'm betting Vera. I think Vera by submission is like 17 to 1, which is stupid. Um I don't think that Amali can take Vera down or that he's going to want to take him down. I literally think he's going to point fight. Um, I can make a case for the losses Vera's had in his career, the likes of Jose Aldo, um, Sandhagen, both of those guys, especially Aldo. Aldo pulled out the vet, um, the vet um, shit in round three and literally just put a body lock on him uh, to win the decision. But O'Malley hasn't got that. I had Jose Aldo on the money line that night. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, um, O'Malley hasn't got that in his back pocket, man. He's not going to look to take Sean down. And if he does, he's going to get armbarred from bottom. Sean is a blue belt. I'm seeing lit fucking casuals, mate, telling me that um, Sean O'Malley can sub Vera, that he's got an underrated jiu-jitsu game. He's training with so-and-so. Shut the fudge up, man. He ain't subbing anyone. He ain't subbing Vera. Um, maybe earlier in his career when he was fighting Chris Montino, it could have happened. Um, but at this stage, when he's fighting, you know, people in the top five, O'Malley isn't subbing anyone. Um, I doubt he's even a blue belt, man. Um, he's wrestling shit. I uh, watched their interviews with um, Brett for the ESPN. And um, something that stuck out the most to me, obviously, we had Vera, the family man. That was all nice to see. Um, it warmed me to him i wanted him to win for that reason i felt like he deserved it looked at his instagram got a huge following like you said the reporters following him around ecuador 68 percent hispanics in um miami he's got a lot of narratives going for him but what i didn't like about o'malley man he pulled out some fucking book from kobe bryant 
talking about um this is what i've been reading lately but i only like to read for like 10 minutes at a time fucking idiot um but it was the fact that he needs these tony robbins type motivational speeches to get him pumped up before a fight i hate that mentality man because they're not in the cage with you and when you do face adversity you know you haven't got your little fucking ipod or whatever to um you know give you a little pep talk um, all you've got is um, your guy in the corner trying to tell you don't fuck it up. Um, so I think when the going gets tough, O'Malley's the type to break, to doubt himself. Um, you know, I think he's going in there with one game plan, and that's to skirt on the outsides, to point fight. And um, yeah, I think if Vera puts it on him, if Vera shows up, not the slow starter that we always see, and he understands the assignment, he implements the leg kicks, um, throws his combinations back Sean up to the cage and kind of bullies him. Um, I think he fares well, man. And uh, even if he doesn't do that, I think O'Malley can literally get in his own head. You know, what's he like come mid-round three um, when it comes to round four or five? Um, I think it's crazy to be laying the chalk on him, man. So there is the side for me, man. And that was probably my longest breakdown I've ever done. I love it. I love it, Rich. I'm all for uh, the extended breakdown here. And you might even have stronger thoughts on this one than I do. Um, I haven't bet very well on these guys, right? So, like, I don't feel like I need to force a bet here. Um, I've done all right on Marlon Chito Vera, but I've looked to fade him a couple times and got burned. Uh, I tried to fade him with Dom Cruz. Um, Dom Cruz, I did think, was winning that fight. But the durability just seemed like it was an inevitability. He was going to get KO'd at some point in that fight. Just didn't have, um, you know, the requisite chin to go for five hard rounds with Vera. Now, when I'm looking at uh, some of the other bets I've had, I've had good ones, right? There's been highlights along the way. I mentioned that fight with Jose Aldo, but even that one, I felt kind of fortunate that Aldo had the sense that God gave these. He's like, yo, I don't need to fight this guy in round three uh, because in round two, he was getting his ass whooped. Right. So Jose Aldo was like, that's it. Body triangle. I'm done with this kid. And he just locked him up and showed that championship savvy. Right. He's just a guy that's been around too long, too experienced, too vet savvy. And I do think that was a lesson for Cheeto as well. He had to learn that. Right. Hey, it doesn't matter if I'm better at fighting. If I can't get out of these bad positions, I can't win the fight. Right. And so he's never been an easy guy to put away. Jose Aldo's on his back. He was never looking for a sub. But here's the other thing that pissed me off about Cheeto. I had him inside the distance. I had him by submission against Rob Font. And he fucking beat the tar out of Rob Font and just <laughs> kept letting him off the hook over and over and over. That's annoying, right? Like, whatever else you want to say, Rob Font is a tough bastard. He does not give up easily, right? Corey Sandhagen, I had him by sub in round five. He's got the guy in a Dar's joke. Still didn't quit. More power to you, right? Rob Font's a tough guy. But I just didn't love the finishing instincts I've seen from Cheeto at all times, right? Against Sean, he showed much better finishing instincts, right? Hurt him to the leg. He was like, hold this. Boom, boom. Just starts firing off elbows from the top position. I feel like we've seen a little bit of like come and go from Cheeto Vera in terms of those finishing instincts. Sometimes he wants to try and kill somebody. Sometimes he's like content to like point at you, laugh, like do the Nate Diaz bullshit. That does not fly with me. I want guys that go out there with a one track mind. I'm going to kill you, right? And he does have that aggression. But he just sometimes like doesn't follow through on it. That seems a little annoying to me. When you look at the Sean O'Malley side, on the other side, I tried to bait him with Howley and Paiva. Didn't work out for me. And I haven't really bet on him much otherwise, right? I kind of just feel like this is a guy that I've seen as um, a little bit of hype, a little bit of substance. I do think he's a very talented striker. You just look at the metrics over time. Not many guys fight in this division and get hit so infrequently. If you, if you look back at my write-up that I did for why I thought Jose Aldo would win, I mentioned the fact Cheeto Vera, very hittable guy, right? Presents himself constantly as a target. So a lot of guys don't land super clean, right? That's why he's not getting knocked out, but he does get hit, right? He just puts his face in the line of fire at times. Um, and he also is not that big. That's the other thing I've always noticed about Cheeto. I think he's like five foot seven um, listed, maybe five foot six. He's a guy that kind of like, did his best work at times, wrapping a hold of people so they couldn't move away from him. He's got a very dangerous clinch game, and he's got a pretty well-rounded game overall. In the clinch, on the ground, at distance, he could be dangerous, right? Uh, so I do think he checks a lot of boxes you'd want from a title challenger. But for me, the one thing that I can't get over is the fact that, um, you know, I, I have visions of this fight going to a close competitive decision, Rich, and then Dana White standing there like this. 
with that dirty smile on in the background. Cause I've seen it before, bro. The Patty Pimblet, Jerry Gordon robbery. He's like looking at Dave Portner, like, I already paid for this one, buddy. We're all good. Then they read the decision. He's like, yeah, I knew that shit was coming. Like it just felt to me like the investment, the company was so clearly behind this one guy putting it in Miami. I think is like, Hey, we're hedging our bets here. If he loses, Ecuador celebration, right? A lot of things that could go right. But I also think the UFC tried to put this together for the coronation of O'Malley. Do I think he's a long-term champion? No, I think there's too many threats. It's too deep a division at 135. There's too many guys on the way. But what I also believe is Ilya Taporia is waiting out there for a big fight, for a big challenge, for a big opportunity. And they've talked about this fight already, Rich. All I'm saying is, from a gut feeling standpoint, I think the UFC would love to try and book that fight. I think they'd love to have Ilya kill him. If somebody's got to kill him, right, take the hype. I think they would much rather it be somebody up a weight class. Hey, uh, no no problem there. Sean lost to somebody up a weight. You forgive that. So for me, I think the UFC wants to put together that fight. Can Sean get there? We'll only find out on Saturday night. Not laying the minus 285 to find out personally. Um, but what I do believe is that if this goes to the scorecards, He's more than likely going to win this fight. I think Cheeto Vera can finish him. We know that. It's in the evidence, right? Somebody said to me, I asked, who's the best underdog bet on the card? They said Cheeto Vera. I said, hey, how can I even argue with that? Like, the facts are, this guy went out there, and he finished him before. So it's like proof of concept is something I always talk about on the show. You got the proof of concept right there. He has done it before. But I also feel like there's going to be a lot of people that bet based on that. And I don't know uh, how I'm going to approach this one yet. I feel like it's a hard title fight to call. I don't like land minus 285 in UFC title fights. I think that's a big number, a big price um, for a competitive fight, for a five-round fight. And the unknowns should always push the line a little bit closer to 50-50. We haven't seen Sean in rounds four, in rounds five. And do I think he can fight there? I, honestly, I do. But when, when I saw that Chris Mutino fight and he was slowing down just a little bit in round three, that is a mild concern for me. So I think Sean's got to do everything right. He's got to cross every T, dot every I, fight a very good fight. And that's a big margin to pay, minus 285, to see if he can do so. So for me, my pick is going to be Sean O'Malley. I think he's going to get the job done via close decision, but I don't feel bullish enough to lay the price. So there you have it, guys. 14 fights in the book. Hell of a breakdown. Hell of a set of scraps, man. I'm excited for the fights as a fan. I'm excited for the fights as a better. Hopefully we can turn it into a lot of coins. Rich, tell the people where they can find you and all the great work you're doing. Shit. Sure. Yeah, as always, man, Twitter, link in the bio for my Patreon. Uh, if you want my bets for this card, it's going to cost you $3. So go and check it out if you want them. Uh, got a Discord group as well. Um, so yeah, all good. Absolutely love it. Likewise for me, guys, if you're looking for more information out of me, you can find that down in the description below. That's write-ups for my bets. That's uh, information, resource documents, social media A-side report each and every week, how people have done in their odds range previously each and every week. So certain documents that I make all the time, and then also all my notes, my tape studies. I've been following a lot of these fighters for years. So if that's stuff you're interested in, it's down on the Patreon below, patreon.com slash Fights. As for me, you can find me everywhere at Liam Picks Fights. That's talking bullshit on Twitter. That's giving free facts and information out there and here each and every week to break down the fights for you guys. So make sure you drop a like on the video, get subscribed to the channel and go support us on podcast platforms. Leave a five-star review if you enjoy the content because it takes me a little extra time to post that every week. God bless. Good luck. Enjoy those fights and come back next time because we're having all the same fun again. Thanks, everybody.